tonight. I'm sure you're all here for the Outdoor Ed Program presentation today and the Eco Program. We, in 2016, Bethel Campus began an Outdoor Ed Program called Educating Children Outdoors. We currently have on both campuses seven faculty that are trained by the North Branch Nature Center in a curriculum that is being used in over 20 schools. Each school interprets it a little differently on their own. Our dream is to have a pre-K through 12 program. Tonight, the teachers of, those pro of the current programs, we have a pre-K five on each, pro on each campus, and we have a middle school version here on the Bethel campus. And those folks are really good at introducing themselves, so I'm not gonna do that. And we're gonna have about a 25 minute presentation and then some questions. Okay. And I may interject as we go along, but I also want you to know that this is a pre-K through 12 vision, and it's also part of our Articles of Agreement. So let me turn it over to one of you, and can you all introduce yep. yourself? I am Melissa Birdie. Um, my eco name is Miss Honeybee. I'm Mark Wheeler. My eco name is Miss Otter. I'm Mrs. Hugobart. To all the children. <laughs> Your name is Miss Owl. Well, my eco name is Miss Owl. We're, we're getting there. I also teach elementary art on the Railton campus, so um, I'm familiar with many of our older students um, across my freshman over the years. So here at, at the Bethel campus, all of the students that are partaking in eco have an eco name. So it's some kind of animal, insect, amphibian, bird or plant that is a Vermont species, and we are starting that in uh, South Burlington as well. So the kids can choose their own name, and they can keep it from year to year, or pick a new one, whatever they want to do. Um, okay. So we have a slideshow that's behind. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I will for Ed programs. Um, the exploration and hands-on investigation encourages a sense of wonder, and students enjoy, and they're very excited about their accomplishments and the new stuff that they explore and experience out in the woods. We go on a lot, a lot of exploration walks, and um, this one on the bottom, the picture on the left, we were pretending that we were millipedes and trying to learn what it would be like to be a millipede crawling over the moss. So this in this lesson, um, we start with a story and then the kids become the part of the story and we walk throughout the woods and they kind of explore it as um, being that, that creature. This is fostering a connection with all parts of the earth, even the, the parts that you can't see on a daily basis, all the little creatures that we don't think about. Um, so in the top right corner, we always sit in a circle around our fireplace and this is a circle of power and respect. This is also something that we use in our middle school and our advisories and in different classes. And this is teaching students to have communication skills, listening, one person talks at a time. Um, they all get to share at some part in their eco afternoon or morning and practice speaking. Um, so in a circle of power and respect, one person talks at a time and they can all see each other. Oh, and the three cares is the foundation of our program, and every kid knows what they are from preschool up until eighth grade, mm -hmm. and they are caring for yourself, so it's how you dress, being prepared to go outside, caring for others, helping everybody um, be safe out there, and carrying sticks in a safe way, working with tools in a safe way, and caring for the earth, making sure we leave everything the way that we found it. Uh, so in this particular day with preschool, our story was about squirrels, and Karen and I are working on fine and gross motor skills with our preschool students. That's so, Miss, Mrs. Turner, the preschool teacher. She's in that center photo with the book on her lap. She's camouflaged. You may not see her. Yeah. Okay. We always start with, you always give questions to the kids. So what do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, 
So they went through this story walk. They were the squirrels looking for their, their nut caches. And at the end, they were building their drays, their squirrel nests. And then we lay down on the ground, and they were pretending that they were squirrels looking up and that their nests that they were just made, they just made were up in the trees and that they were squirrels climbing up. So imagination is a big part. Thank you. So for, yeah. Um, one of the questions in this lesson was, what do you see? What would it be like to be a squirrel and have the nest at the top of the tree? And then we let them come up with it, come up with their um, understanding and what they're learning. So our program builds resilience and self-confidence in children. Again, on the left, I think this was the same. They were millipedes. And then at some point, they turned into nut hatches, and they were flying through the forest, pretending the whole time that they were a nut hatch and trying to experience the forest like they were a bird. Um, let's see. You can jump in at any time. So another big part of our program is learning how to use tools. All the students start with safety protocols. So we learn, we teach them how to use a tool, how to be aware, have a safety circle, a safety space in which they're using that tool, and um, be aware of other people that are around them, how to point the tools down. They always start with peelers, really sharp uh, peelers, and then when they graduate from that and show us that they can use all the safety skills, they move on to blunt tip knives, and then eventually on to saws, using a saw. Um, they're working in small groups, so they're all rotating through different activities so that you don't have a lot of kids working with tools at once. Mm -hmm. They're all seated, they're all holding their bodies in the correct position for their safety. And they actually learn a lot and they remember from, it from last year as well. So um, one of the main things that we do with this eco program in the preschool through five, five program is teach them all of these skills, these safety skills, communication skills, so that when we get to the middle school program, they're ready to go. Um, and they, they know how to work with harder, bigger tools. And this orange rope on the corner here, if I make a circle on the ground, every student knows that they don't go through the circle. And that's how we begin with games and songs and we begin teaching um, what a safety circle is so that it's fun and engaging. And that's another good point that I forgot. All of our lessons are fun. We learn through play. We learn through songs. We get into a circle when we meet up. We sing songs to greet each other. We sing songs about our lessons, whatever we're learning about science, math, English. We're singing songs. We're engaging their learning and their interest. Working with hands is a big part of it. So we, um, they worked with some earth materials to grind them up and mix them with different mediums such as eggs and oil to make their own paint, each natural paint. And they made these tools to make paintbrushes and pencils. Um, and then they made their own art. They also um, make little tree cookies. So they, they use a saw and learn how to, to use a saw and then they make their own little, I think I brought one, it's for a tree cookie. <coughs> and they're kind of proud of it. They put their animal on it, drill a hole. They learn how to, to drill, use a hand drill. Um, they make forts. Everything they do is hands-on. We incorporate all of the subjects that you learn in the school building outside. So science, math, literature, art, music. On the right, we, and this was a kindergarten group, and I think this was a forces of motion, push it, push and pull science lesson, and all the kids made their own tracks so that they could try to make that ball, whatever size ball they chose, um, go through the track. And it took them a while to try to work problem solve and work through um, how they can make that work. When we do, when we discuss habitats um, and ecosystems, they make nests, if we're talking about specifically about <coughs> birds. We 
connect to literature. So the, on the bottom left is uh, Leaf, the Leaf Man. I don't know if you guys recognize that story. If you have little kids, you do. If you're a teacher, and symmetry, some art and math connections on the top left. Lots of math projects too. That's a, one of our kindergarten teachers. We have the kids do a math game, and then we sing. Um, we have some science connections where we're investigating the rotten log and another science unit with, where we are building insects, bodies of insects. Another piece is um, journaling and sit spots. This is a big part of it. So we're again helping students build self-esteem and a sense of calmness and patience. And they choose a special spot in the woods and they look around awareness, observation, and they take time to um, let's see what's around them and take notes. We're also teaching a science journaling skill. Winter is fun too. So we are, most of our year is winter. Um, so we just keep going, the learning continues. We do a lot of tracking, bottom left, they're using the tracking card to try to figure out what the tracks are. Um, making some symmetrical designs in the top right. We do a lot of compass and direction work and map building in the winter. This is a lesson, the big picture in the middle about sugar, maple syrup, and the energy in a tree in the roots that goes up to the top of the year. So it was a game with a ball where they had to be the, the liquid that went up, the energy that went up with the tree. So the three kids at the bottom of the roots, you can visualize this. The trunk is red and blue there. And then the other two kids up at the top with this pretty uh, honeybee is out of the branches and leaves, etc. So there's a whole science lesson that goes in with understanding what happens when the tree through the season. And then of course our magnifying glasses are eye loops that we use to investigate. And then fire. So fire, we teach a lot about awareness, safety first. We get to cook on the fire. We learn what sticks and materials are good for building the fire. That's a science that has to has to do with fire. And I'm just kind of okay. yeah, great. We're moving into the middle school program. So last fall we started the well, last winter we started the middle school program. And this is our first school year. And so we don't have any of the fifth or sixth graders because Eco was the earlier grade. So we're still waiting for those kids to grow up and walk right into the middle school program. So we're starting to scratch for the middle schoolers. Um, obviously, safety is first. Thanks. And a lot of practicing, a lot of learning outdoor skills. A lot of these um, middle schoolers have a lot of skills in the outdoors but they all need to be fine-tuned. And, and there's a lot of missing loops, missing pieces that they should know in Vermont living here. You know, so we're, we're focusing on those things. How do do this? All right, they love fire building. This year we have themes for each of the mini-mesters, so there's six mini-mesters, three trimesters in the, in the school. We're all part of the same system and fire building and cooking on the open fire is a big um, piece of it from this session and a little bit of it um, we wove in when we were, last session we were doing trail building we put in an inner loop you'll see the maps on this board here that uh this a uh, easel easel board yeah and that the kids you made you can look at these at your <laughs> yeah you can look at all the materials later at your leisure um, but we always weave in, you know, it's a fire building day, let's take a break from trail building and make a fire. And they have learning, they don't use matches and they don't use lighters, they use flint and steel, they're practicing with bow drills. We just saw a, a film about a, um, a, just, a, a press, I just lost the name of it. You know, there's a, there's a hand drill and then there's one that you go up and down, a press drill, basically and um, makes the fire better, faster, <laughs> but you're, it's friction, right? The fire comes in a little stick. 
the other kids this year, um, this session, are you'll see it over here. They, they're some of the examples of carving with fire, and they're using a stick with a um, ember on the end, and holding their own spoon that they're going to be carving and blowing on it. And this is, we discovered the safest way instead of having two sticks together with an ember that you're going to have to pick up with these kind of things, the little sticks. We're not doing that. So this is an example you can take a look. And we have one student who's already gone back and carving. We use blunt tip knives to go through the whole safety thing first, of course. And they're doing a great job. <laughs> they're really careful with it. Um, this is some of our cooking for hot chocolate and tea. Uh, one day we couldn't get up the hill and it was too icy and so we um, made a fire down, right, yeah, down in the snowbank. Yeah. All right, so let's keep on moving. They have a lot of fun in their morning. There's some art that's happened. The acorn can be uh, double check on making sure there's no allergies to start with because acorn is a nut. And we collected acorns and we chucked them and made them into flour and made our dough boys over the fire with chucked acorn flour mixed with it. And it, it, it's a very rich food. It's a um, Native American food source. We're trying to teach how to live more closely to the land and what you, well, how they can eat off of it as well. Um, we don't pull around with mushrooms. You can tell them about them, but they're not touching them. Uh, we do it a lot with ropes and knots with each group. Um, there's one lashing over here. Um, there's a little bowling picture down there. If you want to experiment with it, make your own. They're, um, they're learning the knots, and they're pretty important around here. Okay, leadership skills. I'm not going to read this whole thing. So, so qualities of a leader, what do you need to know to be a leader, and what does a good leader in the wilderness need to do? Some of this, oops, I did this one. Okay. A lot of this and a, comes from my history and the things that I do in the rest of my life. And a lot of this is coming from the main guide curriculum as well that Lindley Brainerd has so kindly introduced to us with a very, actually Lindley, you can talk about it a little bit. We are basing our curriculum for middle school and hopefully towards the high school on their work, 80 years of their work, of working with, um, to be a guide in Maine, you have to be certified. That process people learn on their own, pretty much. To be a guide in Maine, you could take a high school certification program and learn so much of it. They've offered us to adapt it to Vermont. They've invited me at um, Lee Sprainard's um, suggestion, thank you very much, to come in and learn what they do firsthand when they do a testing camp for the high schoolers that are at camps in the summer, and they go up there for a week and have tests for a week, both hands-on tests and some learning stuff. Ms. Brainerd, Mrs. Brainerd, could you explain it in a little nutshell? Sure. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm Mrs. Brainerd, Lindley Brainerd. Um, I teach shop in the middle school and um, I've worked with this program so I did the program as a teenager and then I've worked with the program for 15 years training students and um, and now I'm a tester with the whole organizational unit that runs the program and basically it's a, it's a pretty extensive curriculum that book that Owen was holding up a moment ago is is the curriculum um, and the students they train for five full weeks in the summer and they learn everything from, it's billed as a wilderness leadership program. So the idea is at the end of it, they're able to guide and lead trips. So it's not just what are the survival skills and the wilderness skills that they need, but how to be a good leader, how to know what to do in certain scenarios and when, when things go wrong, what, what's appropriate or inappropriate to do. Um, and as Vana said, they, uh, 
<laughs> they have, it's 21 tests total, and it's a mixture of practical physical skills and written tests, everything from axemanship and fire building, they're running their own campsites with no adults in them, they feed three meals a day to adults who just show up at designated times and they have to serve a meal and be presentable and um, and then in between all of that they're taking the written tests and so it's a pretty extensive program but it's also it's well established uh, it's in its I want to say maybe 87th year so it's a it's a very well established program and it's centered around Maine but um, the director of the program has agreed to allow us to adapt it to Vermont and so the things that traditionally would be sort of Maine knowledge and the map of Maine, <coughs> you know, obviously we would shift to Vermont knowledge. And where's the only school doing this right now? What's that? We're the only school in Vermont doing this? As far as I know. Yeah. There are a handful of high schools in Maine that have adapted the curriculum to a high school program. Um, and and this I'm, is our vision about the high school, and we need to work with the high school faculty and administration, is to build that pre-K-5, then the middle, and come into the high school with kids that have all of this knowledge base and all of this interest, and eventually bring it, them back into a mentoring program with little kids on both campuses or middle kids. I'm gonna try to get us to head towards wrapping up, knowing the time issue, but I wanna get Gay Lynn in here. Yep. So do you want to This is the second year of Eco on the Royalton campus. Uh, we started it last year at North Branch Nature Center that uh, teaches the eco uh, level one and level two um, through Castleton as well. Once and I were able to be in, in eco level two at North Branch last year. I invited elementary teachers at the Rogan campus who have the interest and the commitment to come and with their classes out to be in the outdoors for learning experiences. And in the second year, uh, we've got the grades two through five, and our schedule is intermittent. We meet alternating weeks and are trying to integrate uh, with um, tech with the librarian, with the classroom teachers bringing in science where f &P reading is giving a lot of focus on the literacy, but we have the literacy and the math games that we do as well. Our environment that we go out into is uh, Riverbank and Riparian Zone. So we're learning um, how our environment is different, and I really I think it would be exciting for our kids to be able to explore each other's ecosite because they are radically different, although we are seven miles distant. Um, the river's on the other side of the road here, whereas when I go out with the children, the river is just over the bank. Um, I, I think the uh, deep impression from last April after snow melts and April vacation and, and the waters came through when the third graders came out, they could see the ripples of the silt along the trail that they knew were impressions that the river makes on its riverbed and, and they could say this was underwater with a sense of awe in their voice and that um, really strikes home when they get to experience and see that. Uh, the librarian and I alternate eco and tech um, I had not participated in tech with our four or five students, nor had the librarian participated in ECOS too. Um, we've devised in our alternating week a um, journal project on their Chromebooks. There's a book reader app, I'll just pass these around. There's just a couple journal entries in there. But on Eco Days, the students um, have access to cameras. They have some question prompts. Um, they're take, getting their observations while they are outdoors and the following week when we are in the library and they have their Chromebooks out, um, they have are, are asked to recall with some prompts. What, um, what was the weather? Who was with you? What were the activities? And then there's a photo file that they can access on Drive and plug in. So um, the end of November, but it feels very much in the early weeks of school, <coughs> these four and fifth grade students have three journal entries. Um, our first adventure outdoors was actually doing the Royalton. Royalton had its 250th historical anniversary, and there was a historical quest created by high school students uh, working with a town historian. So that's the first project that the kids um, and the librarian and the classroom teachers um, and I did. We were able to follow the press path, document it on cameras, and the cemetery is, is right beside our school. So one student there, Mackenzie, and our further questions and explorations um, she was curious about the veteran, Elijah Kent, whose farm was on the property that is now the cemetery, and her question asks, you know, did he provide food to the soldiers? 
you know, like it brought them back to that sense of place, and that's what's really important for the time we have access with these children is helping them get to know where they are from and develop um, sort of their their roots and sense of place because this will carry with them and all the students who are here now. Um, as you consider what your futures are and, and what horizons you may visit, um, ECO is an opportunity to really know where you're from and who you are from your experiences being outdoors many Thank years you. ago. Thank you, I want to um, talk about things. Let me take some commentary or questions. <laughs> And um, just to let you know, we also, the art teacher goes out, the Spanish teacher's gone out, they're, they're speaking in Spanish outdoors. I think people do that in other parts of the earth. So we're, we're trying to integrate lots of things in different ways. Questions and comments for these folks? Or accolades, or leaves in the park. I want to thank Melissa and Mark that they put into the presentation and um, providing really um, good leadership and support for a fledgling program. Um, I like the fledgling piece. <laughs> Just little wings. <laughs> we appreciate being able to share the knowledge and the time with these kids. And I see the differences in some of them, especially in your sense of being, it's already showing up. Thanks to the need to have a connection with the doors and to learn the skills that are outside of the classroom itself. And using the outdoors as the classroom is one to show up. It fosters stewardship, resilience, imagination, leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I remember in the merger process, at one point we were talking about having a, a complete uh, place in Rochester where we would do similar work like this. And then we, Rochester left us. And we were still there. But in the Articles of Agreement, I think it's Article 4D, it says we will have an outdoor education program. And I'm proud to say that we do have a program and what we see is a growing program. We know that around the state this is happening, other schools are doing this. It's not a lot of middle and high schools that are doing this. So again, we're pioneers in this and we're leading. And Tarrant uh, Institute for Innovation and Education, who we're in partnership with, recently um, wrote on their blog with UVM about our program. And that's linked in the agenda and we can post that again to the Facebook and um, social media sites. And it's a really nice little article, and it uh, highlights us throughout the state. Thank you all. Thank you. We're going to leave this table here. You're welcome to look at this at your leisure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You probably won't be up top. Oh, can I ask a question? Of course. Go, go. Uh, I'm just wondering, in the, uh, down the road, if there are going to be any uh, food and forest production uh, modules within the eco program? Food and forest? Yeah, just agricultural endeavors as, you know, as another piece to the puzzle? So I, I think I can address that a little bit, Lisa. That's Lisa McCurry. She's a board member from Bethel. And we have talked about having a sugar house here on this campus. And there's some, some talk about that. One of the things we want to do with the Tarrant Institute and with community members and partners is to call together a group of us and to do a bigger, more concrete vision for the pre-K-12 vision. And that does include things like a sugar house. We've talked about having other food here as well. Last week, I was given some goose, um, what are they, Ch Ch goose tenders. One of our students got a goose, and he made them into like, you know, chicken tenders. Oh, he made yeah. goose tenders, and he brought them in, and they were delicious. Last week, we had five students, I think, get their, their youth deer. We would love to have some version of that, and we know families are going to do what they want with that. But, and we've also talked to the game warden locally, and he was talking to us about bringing game here 
and teaching students how they test those biologically. Like they take a tooth, they take a, a sample out of a hoof, they look for tick disease in moose, and that he's more than willing to do some of that work with us as well. So nothing is concrete, but we want to call together. And I thought you might want to be in that group where we would get together and bring in community members, educators, and community partners. Yeah. And there's a greenhouse right here that's yeah. the greenhouse process getting processed together with praise for the kids. Yeah, that'll get going this spring. Thank you. The board meeting hasn't even started yet. <laughs> We do have a dangling, what they call widow maker up in the woods. If anybody knows how to use a chainsaw, we would love to know if you sell logs or if you know any loggers. We need some help with that. Her daughter, I see her room chainsaw. Should we call the meeting to order? Thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you all three. So I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.38. Um, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Um, I have one. The, the music proposal should say schedule proposal, um, just so we can make that shift because it's a broader request. And Lisa, I had mentioned a student uh, executive session. Yes. Yes. OK. Anything else that needs to be adjusted on the agenda? Okay. All right. Um, thank you. I think for tonight we'll um, skip over the assigned times and timekeeper piece, if that's okay. And we'll just try to um, we'll just try to be concise. Anyway. All right. So that brings us to public comment. Anyone? General public comment? Okay. All right. Um, consent agenda in this packet are minutes from our meeting on October 15th in Royalton. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Approve the minutes on uh, Tuesday, October 15th. Any second on that? All second. Okay. Approve the minutes as written. Great. Everyone in favor of approving the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Great. The minutes are so approved. Um, board comment? Um, not, not a board comment, but I, I wonder if you, you get two resignations as a board member and also a uh, custodian here, Wendell uh, Wills. Uh, maybe we already did that. I don't know, but he's no longer with us. And right. We did that. He was last meeting. Mm -hmm. last yeah. Meeting. We accepted with, with regret that resignation for retirement. Maybe that wasn't. Um, yeah, I thought we accepted it. So that, right, and we have the um, resignation of Shannon Morrill Cornelius. She moved to Bethel. Um, so if you haven't seen our ad in the paper, if there's anyone who would like to um, submit their name to be considered for that position, I've heard that we have not received any letters yet, correct? That's what I was told as of yesterday. So um, we do have that vacant spot. For a Royalton resident? For a Royalton resident, yes, please. And uh, it's two and a half, well, almost a little more than two years remaining of that spot, that seat. Is that correct? Oh, I can't well, less than to, that. Um, we would probably get it only to the town meeting. And then they'd have to run. Mm -hmm. and then, then I know we all staggered as board members, so right. I didn't, couldn't remember where she we stood. We have a midterm right. resignation. We just fell through the end of the current year. Yeah, that would be, oh, and then that would be for one year. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It would be until until the election in, in March. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, so that brings us to the schedule presentation. 
welcome. Get the conversation started. Um, just for folks who were There is a here. letter uh, that I gave to, uh, yeah. if they want to pass that out to the board members, because I don't think they've seen it. Oh, the letter wasn't in the board packet? It, it is. It came with me tonight, and I just um, gave it to Lisa to yeah. distribute to the board members. Okay. So. All right. Well. I want to give them a minute to read it. Well, maybe just for context for the audience, too, maybe I can just lay out what the what the letter proposes. So um, just for a little bit of background, um, a couple of us parents came to the board last spring when we realized some scheduling issues that were preventing students that are involved in music from fulfilling their graduation requirements. Um, so the board had a conversation about that at the time, the schedule itself at the high school hasn't changed for this year, but there was a, a PE class added during learning block that took some pressure off that uh, scheduling issue, but didn't entirely resolve it. So since then, um, recently a larger group of parents came together just to talk about our own children's experiences with getting the courses that they're interested in taking. And what we discovered is that uh, everyone at the meeting, all of our children either currently uh, would like to be taking something that is not available to them, that they can't access, or uh, in the case of freshmen, down the line will have a hard time fulfilling their graduation requirements. Uh, so just from the folks who you know, sat at that table, we heard things like you know, a student who's interested in design, unable to take art classes, uh, freshmen who take band and chorus, never having an opportunity to fulfill their health requirements. So a variety of concerns. And as the parent group talked, we, we agreed that we got the sense that our children are not the only kids at the high school who are having a hard time accessing opportunities. And so we didn't create a proposal or come tonight so that you all can get our own you know, personal children into French one or something. We're not looking for a specific fix for our own kids or kind of a Band-Aid on the schedule as PE and learning block is, is serving as for this year. but. Um, in keeping with the promise of the merger to provide additional opportunities for students and in following up on the action items in the strategic plan that talk about students having increased opportunity through different courses and also uh, parents and students being involved in decision making. Um, our letter proposes the creation of two committees, one being a scheduling committee that would involve administration teachers and also students and parents with a specific mandate, not just to argue about schedules, <laughs> but to really dig into possibilities for creating a high school schedule that will maximize students' ability to access opportunities and take the courses they want to take. And uh, our hope is that that committee will be given a mandate to propose a solution to the scheduling troubles. We know it will never be a perfect solution because scheduling is hard at every high school, but we feel that uh, it, it, it could be improved upon. The second committee that we're proposing, knowing that fulfilling PE requirements is an acute challenge for many students, um, is a committee also comprised of administration, teachers, students, and parents that would specifically look at flexible pathways for PE. So the parent group um, that came together to discuss our concerns has actually done a lot of research about what's going on at other schools. We've researched different schedule models, and we've also looked at how different high schools handle PE. And it turns out there's some really, really creative approaches at different high schools in Vermont to flexible pathways where um, students maybe are involved in dance and that counts toward part of a PE requirement. Or even we heard a really creative idea that students could do physical forms of community service such as um, you know cutting wood, cutting and stacking wood for senior citizens in the community or raking leaves for senior citizens and that that might be something that could help students fulfill part of their PE requirement. So we are proposing a second committee that could specifically 
look into that issue and the possibility of adding some flexible pathways to the PE program at the high school. Does anyone have questions or anything that someone would like to add? Is, is everybody here concerned with the scheduling? Does that work? I mean, I'm here all the time anyway, but I'm No, but I'm here. Okay. 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 Good to know. Um, so the schedule right now is a modified block, right? For the learning block every day. Okay. The same schedule that the school had uh, before the merger? Okay. Right, or approved before the merger? I'm not really, no. no. I was going to say, we heard concerns about the schedule prior. <clears throat> To the merger too. Yeah. Um, what's that? Uh, the year prior to the pre-merger, right? We had a committee for half the year talking about possibilities, um, and then you say his name, and Dean came in and just said, "This is what we're doing because this is what Bethel does," and then we merged, and it's what we did. That's, okay. That's correct. Yes, Kristen. Um, so I just want to speak also I signed the letter with Lori rather than letting her be off by herself um, so and my husband Brian also signed it so our daughter Grace um, gave up chorus this year um, but I think what I think what's important to know first is we have a fantastic array of classes and opportunities at our high school and so as someone who came from Bethel whose first child took um, went to Bass because there just wasn't anything there were exactly um, zero <laughs> AP classes to my second child who's in her sixth. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so I think we're just at that next place where, okay, so we have all these wonderful courses. Now what, what do we need to do to make sure that kids can take advantage of all of them? So I have a son as well kind of coming out through who loves music, who spent tonight in our living room practicing for Winooski. And if he gets to be a senior and he wants to take an AP course, he may have to give that up, or he will have to give that up, um, as far as we understand. Um, so we're just asking for the opportunity to help solve the issue, be creative, <coughs> and I, I believe we can do it. I believe that there are solutions out there, and that we're just at that place now where we're figuring things out, and we've arrived here, um, and I'm optimistic <coughs> that, that the issue can be solved. <clears throat> how, would you, how would you frame the issue? What, what is the issue that we're looking for a solution to? Uh, a <laughs> schedule that allows students to access an array of opportunities. There was vocalization that today's delayed schedule with a modified schedule because of the start of the day was different that they saw more of their teachers more consistently and that that was a positive feeling um, compared to a usual green. Mm -hmm. May I? Bridget, and then I'll find the right spot. All right. Oh, yeah, um, I'm Tim Fitzgerald. I'm an English teacher at the high school. Um, I would just speak for myself as a, as a member of the staff. I don't speak for the entire staff. Um, I see a lot of discontinuity in our, in our schedule. And um, just as an example, with our current schedule, um, I have students in one of my classes that I will see for 50 minutes this week. Because, yeah, 50. Um, because, for the whole week, because of an interruption of a music festival and shortened classes today. If we were in a more in closer to like a daily model, I would have 130 minutes of contact time. Um, so I think talking about, you know, not necessarily <coughs> jumping on it, but talking about the idea of classes that more meet more frequently would um, perhaps negate some of these interruptions that we face all winter long. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we ask a lot of our high-flying students. Um, they go to music festivals, they leave early for basketball games, and we don't see them enough mm -hmm. to teach them well a lot of the time. Um, that's my concern. Okay. Thank you. 
So, as you may be aware, Disney Plus now has a show called High School Musical, the musical, the series. Um, and one of the uh, conflicts in the original High School Musical, which I've never actually seen, but I haven't had to because my children are of the generation, my niece, my nephew, um, one of the main conflicts is that one of the young men feels like he has to choose between his life as an athlete and wanting to be in the musical. And some young thing, probably 22, on Facebook the other day was like, people don't even have to choose that stuff anymore. And I went, I didn't have to choose that. In 1993, in a high school situation that was not ideal in many, many ways, and I don't understand how in 2009, when we should have learned more about this stuff, we're making our children make more sacrifices between physics and chorus, mm -hmm. which is literally the choice that Alexis had to make this year. And fortunately for her, uh, physics is in two separate semesters this year, so she could do one semester of physics and one semester of chorus, only after begging the music teacher to do it and literally having to prove that <laughs> certain colleges require physics. So that was fun. But like this is the li this is the narrow little shoot that a lot of students because it's your daughter, it's my daughter, it's I bet every teacher in here could name two or three kids who have had to deal with this. Like and to a certain degree we are a small school. There are only so many options, there are only so many slots in the day, there are only so many teachers, but I can't help but look and think we've got to be able to do a better job of balancing this. And if we have something like the committee, I don't even remember if my, I told you like, you could put my name on the letter or not, um, it, but one of the things that came up was how other schools are dealing with the scheduling. And I remember looking at it and going, well, we don't want to say this is how it should be because we want to make sure in that letter and we all agreed, or at least nobody told me I was wrong, uh, that we want to do what's right for us, but that there are other schools that can do this and that do do this, so we know it is possible. And so I would like to see a school with a really vibrant participation in a variety of courses, to not just be on the, oh, you're the high flying track, that means you take these classes, and maybe you could fit a band or a chorus in a couple of times in the next four years. Uh, I don't think that's ideal. Or, you know, if you go to a vocational, um, the Hartford Tech kids are here for half a day, and they're away for half a day. And so if band or chorus falls in that half a day, <laughs> yeah. um, and I feel like we need to do something to support those kids, because they have a voice. They should be in a band or chorus or the arts or whatever they choose in. And we may not be able to give them the ideal music experience, just as uh, the example that keeps coming to mind. But it's not just music. It's studio art. It's English. It's whatever it is. But I feel like we should be able to work in some flexibility that we're not just, you know, these kids by the end. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that we sort of wrapped up at the end. This isn't just an issue for kids that are high flying. I yeah. think this is pervasive yeah. and mm -hmm. particularly troublesome for kids whose parents can't be here mm -hmm. to talk for them. Yes. Or aren't even aware that it's an issue for them. So I, I, I mean, I know we're so little kids. It doesn't matter how big you are. There's only so much time in the day, so you have to make choices. But I think the choices that some of these kids are having to make have really limited opportunities for their future and not just for now. I mean, I think it's a long term issue. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi, uh, so I'm Katie Collins and I signed the letter as well, so I am concerned about the schedule. And Reed, you had asked a little bit about what the issue was. Um, my concern would be so my daughter's a freshman and coming in this year, she wanted to take. Uh, French one, and she was told she could not because band was at that time. So starting out as a freshman, you know, that's a little bit discouraging, just knowing that already she's not able to take, you know, a certain course that she wants to. And then even for next year, she's already said to me, Mom, I'm not sure if I'll take chorus. And she loves to sing. And I'm like, well, why don't you do that? And she said, well, I really want to make sure I get my physical education and health requirements in. I need to make sure. So. You know, for them to have to think about this and have to stress over that already, you know, that's definitely concerning. And I think we can be creative. We did call around, did some research. Um, we can do this for these students and allow them to have those opportunities that we said that we would have with the merger. So. Yeah, Andy. Um, so, <laughs> brought up 
in May, maybe, a uh, previous board meeting, and we talked about having being able to fulfill health therapy fee requirements during the learning block and providing other opportunities for more independent study or something. Was anything, has anything happened on that front? Yes, we created a uh, learning block PE class, which meets three times a week. So then students who want to take banding course have the opportunity to, to do that. Is it only twice a week? No. Uh, and we also had, were asked by some students about a flexible PE option, and there are two students that we uh, have allowed to meet graduation requirements through uh, flexible option. So when we've been asked, we, we've tried to work with them. If I could just address them. <laughs> Me? Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm tell again. I'm a student at the school. Um, with the learning about PE, I would also just want to underline there's a lot of student concern about learning block and just sort of dis uh, unrest um, because it it's a mat. It's, how long is it? How long is it? Forty minutes. Forty minutes or so. Yeah, forty minutes of our day every day and so PE for example only meets two of those days and that's the only class that's allowed to be taken during learning block and while I, I understand the value of having the time for students to meet with teachers and uh, especially for AP teachers to grab us and be like hey there's some supplementary stuff I also cons am concerned that we prioritize it over actual productive class time. We could lengthen the last period block. We could do, we could add a class in there that isn't PE. Um, and there's a lot that we do. Again, I don't speak for the whole student body. I'm just speaking for those of us that talk about it. But it's definitely an issue. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the PE in learning block. I just wanted to point out that that kind of it's a great example of the difference between a band-aid and a lasting solution. So, uh, yes, technically the students who are taking that PE during that learning block are like I know now my son who's a junior can fulfill his graduation requirements. So that's great. At the same time, my three my three sons are all in that PE class, and while it's incredibly fun, apparently, um, they they are regularly uh, scolded for not being in other places. They are called to the office for not being where they're supposed to be, and they're regularly double booked by a teacher that you know wants to wants to do some science during that time, and they're like, I can't. I'm supposed to be in PE. And so while they are technically fulfilling the requirement and they're having fun doing it, it's, it's n certainly not a solution that my two sons who are freshmen want to continue for the next two years because um, it actually creates a lot of other conflicts <coughs> during the learning block time that, that are, are fairly stressful for the kids. Thank you. Claire and then I was just going to say, it's actually, we, teachers have had to, because we have such limited time with this every other day schedule, that each of the AP teachers has chosen one of those learning blocks to teach an additional class, which essentially freezes other kids out from getting help from us during that period. But it does provide an extra time for the students who, again, are the high flyers. It's not really sustaining or helping kids who need additional help. So even that is like a bandage, but it patches over one problem but creates another. So um, it's not, it's, it's a very temporary solution, I think, to this problem. Actually, I, part of what I was going to say, Claire, just to mention, so it is in some ways like a bandage, the schedule, because we don't see our kids and as frequently as um, curriculum <laughs> Would, would like, uh, we tried to make do with this time, um, going about time. But I think it wouldn't be as necessary if we had a different schedule that was a little bit more conducive overall. Um, and the second piece to what I was going to say is um, hopefully with maybe this conversation, this committee, we can also maybe look at returning to having multiple pathways at our high school. Um, I've been there for well, 14 years or so. 
And um, we used to do a lot of the things we're asking for now. Mm -hmm. um, Pre-merger, we, we offered everything. Yeah. And we, we also had um, a means to achieve, like so we have AP courses that are accessible once you get to be like an upperclassman. Mm -hmm. But we currently, since the merger, we've done away with all the pathways to get kids prepared for that, like appropriately prepared. Um, and we're saying that, oh, we can, you know, we'll just, <clears throat> I would like to, as a parent, I guess I can say that on the radar here, um, as a parent for my kid, I would like her to have an opportunity to not just, oh, we offer AP, but to actually have a pathway that takes her there mm -hmm. in an appropriate way so she can also be successful in those courses, mm -hmm. as well as I think for all kids, for the struggling kids, I'd like them to have a pathway, and I'd like the middle kids to have a path options. I just want options for our kids the way that we used to have them at our school. So the can you say more course. about what those pathways look like? <laughs> um, sure. Um, just, um, uh, hmm, how do I say it without it? I've been scolded a few times for this. So um, leveled courses, but not tracking. Leveled as in options for students' interests as well as ability. So no, again, no one's forced to take anything. But if they're interested and they want the challenge and they want a little bit more of a focus for any of our AP courses, for science, for math, for there's an actual track that they can take to get them there. So there's not a prerequisite which creates the tracking. It's no, like, no, there never has been in my experience. And uh, again, in my 14 years of school, we never had that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. But again, that's. Something but you could be lost in calculus right, if you yeah. didn't have yeah, the yeah. skill. I mean, calculus. right. I mean, the prereq would be, you know, a meeting with the parent and the guidance counselor and the teacher if there was a concern. But we always wrapped around all of our students in the situation with the family. And everything. It wasn't just, no one was making decisions without that kind of a, a, you know, we made sure that people didn't also just, like, get wrapped. You know, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, like, I, I remember Alexis would sometimes come in and be like, oh, so-and-so's in academic English now because they weren't feeling challenged enough. Right. And I mean, that obviously didn't happen three quarters of the way into the school year, but it definitely was, and, and it's how, it, I know it still happens to a certain extent if, you know, somebody says you're a better fit in this class, um, because I saw it, but again, you know, Alexis would be, and it didn't at least feel to me as a parent like, oh, you, you are in the dumb track, and you're going to be in the dumb track. It didn't feel like that at all. It didn't feel like there was a smart track and a dumb track. It felt like there were the challenging courses <laughs> and the courses that were, you know, maybe the pre-college, maybe the pre-AP, and the ch courses that were still challenging but less challenging. And I, again, it's hard to, to you know, articulate this right. Kids, but yeah, struggle you well. are still yeah. right expected now, to hit the marks, but maybe you needed extra support, or maybe you weren't headed for an AP class, so you didn't want to, t or headed for college, so you didn't want to take that AP class in English, but maybe you wanted to do an apprenticeship, so you were taking more challenging classes in math. And it didn't feel like kids were stratified into one area or another, at least, again, as a parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have one kid. I don't have a broad perspective, but that was certainly the way it always felt to me. Okay, Alexis. Uh, sort of adding on to what Mrs. G and my mother said, um, the honors and academic options for classes will also, I know in math at least, differently paced. Um, and I think that was also really helpful um, because some people wanted faster pace in a class like that, and some people need it slowed down, go in more depth. And it didn't mean like, oh, you're, you're better at math, so you're in the, like there were kids who were better than me at math who were in the slow class, because that was what made it for them. And I think that was really helpful, and I think when we decided to get rid of that, it, we lost a lot. Um, yes. So hi, I'm Molly uh, O'Brien. I'm a teacher at the high school as well. So just to cycle back in to the scheduling specifics of that, I think that what I'm hearing is that the concern is about the level of options that we have and trying to find ways to 
even that out and spread more options across the day so that kids have more opportunities. Am I understanding correctly? So realistically, we would have to look really closely at the amount of classes that are available to be taught. Just in a realistic situation, we have the class time, we have the day we have. We can't just add hours. So we need to be really realistic and think really logically about where those hours are going to be organized. Mm -hmm. Yes. That makes so, sense. And I think that's absolutely true, but I will note that before the merger, we had fewer teachers and fewer students, so we could do that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's a great answer. It's doable. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding your point. You're very good at synthesis. It's like you're an English teacher. Yeah, that is great. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I would just, I guess, say maybe as a word of caution, um, the parents that have discussed this, I reached out to a number of other schools and we provided the board and the administration with actually bell schedules from a variety of other schools uh, in the hopes that the conversation be not simply about things like done in the past but but they can broaden also and there's value in that conversation like what why does the schedule seem so acutely challenging right now and what are ways you know, what are ways that it worked better, but also broadening beyond that, every high school struggles with scheduling, whether they're big or small, and other, other high schools are using a variety of different models, and so, you know, I, I would just caution against being totally insular in kind of the, the walls of the current high school, but, but hopefully, having a broader based conversation about what are some other options that are out there that maybe haven't been explored in our district before. Um, because, you know, we don't have to totally reinvent the world wheel. We could take some of what has worked well historically in Railton and in Bethel, but also what's working now at other Vermont high schools. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that we continually talk about is how we can get more community engagement and um, have parent committee and voice and student voice mm -hmm. and so I, I wonder if at this point in time the board supports the idea of creating these two committees or what our what our thoughts are about that. Andrew? Well, can we hear from the administration on their thoughts about if they're willing to work with these committees if they're interested in working with it i know mm -hmm. like before the merger we did have the scheduling committee that put a lot of work into coming up with different options but then because we were set, sort of time crunched and actually putting together the schedule and something it was kind of one was chosen and, and so i don't know that all the work was mm -hmm. used and so it would be good i think to go through a deliberative process to really come up with what makes sense and what works um, but I, i'd like to hear what you're talking <laughs> sure. Um, well, I would, you know, adding a eighth class uh, could impact teacher assignments. Uh, could Im have budgetary impact impacts. Uh, and I'm not. You know, we haven't seen the first draft of, of what we've proposed so far and how that's going to impact the tax rate. But one of one of the things we're really looking to do this year is to keep any tax increases to a minimum. Uh, when we talk about adding, usually that sometimes comes at a cost. Uh, so I'd, I'd be worried to look at that and how that may play out. Um, there are also some contractual issues, and I know we're going into uh, union negotiations, so we would have to know what's on the table there with the union uh, as far as what may come out next year's contract. Uh, so there's some sensitivity around deliberations with public with some of these issues um and well presumably if you laid out what the you know constraints were as far as you know like the teachers can only teach for this amount of hours or whatever then you build this like regardless of whether it's through this committee or some other way like you have to arrange the schedule around that so mm -hmm. you know it's more yeah i i think we Given how busy we are, and, and we've, we've been doing a number of, of things, moving staff around to try to 
free up our workload. I'm a little bit worried, uh, having seen the union in our last meeting with the administration in South Wales and talk about uh, initiative fatigue. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to start a deliberative process that we would have to deal with by February because we need to know what our numbers are going to be to generate schedules for next year. So we'd be talking about undergoing a, a big process. We, we planned all along to have a scheduling, have scheduling work done at the faculty. Uh, last year we started, in, I believe, in the end of October, November. We had three faculty meetings. Uh, and then we voted after some deliberation in the fourth meeting. Uh, that'll be the plan for this year. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have one or two opportunities for, for members of the public and students to come in and provide input to, to that. I'm concerned about, you know, we're three and a half weeks away from Christmas break and would like to have some idea where we're going and not drag on the long schedule process, so. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I'm Sam Griffin, I teach in high school, also a member of the association. And I um, just wanted to speak to the idea that I think the initiative fatigue is a separate issue um, that we maybe don't want to get into in this form right now. But the gist of that is um, people being feel, feeling like their work, that they don't have any efficacy in the work that they do. So like last year, Again, maybe we don't need to get into too much detail, but we had the scheduling, you know, the time that staff spent looking at different schedules. Uh, we did have three meetings, but many staff, you know, volunteered hours of their own time uh, discussing options, alternatives, etc. And we left with the conclusion that not all, because I can't speak for all the staff, but that many of the staff felt was predetermined in a sense. So that's where the initiative fatigue come from. And I think, like I said, that's, that's a separate issue from this conversation about trying to find ways to give our students, you know, more choices to take what they would like and what they need. And also, as I see it, a related issue to meet students at the levels where they're at so they can best get served. Um, because, and again, speaking for myself, but in the current system as it is, we're not doing as good a job of that as we could be. Okay. And I'd also just to address possible issues with the association. I mean, it is a negotiations year. It's coming up. Um, but we don't know what any of those possible issues might be yet. And no matter what sort of schedule um, that we do decide that we want, we have to figure out um, those issues of equity. So, um, We'll cross that bridge when we get there, but I wouldn't say that <clears throat> worries about those issues should preclude us from starting these conversations and having these committees. Uh, we can work through that the way that we have in the past and the way that we will continue to do to best meet our students' needs. So, thank you. Thank you. Lindsay, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. And the I'm Carol, I am a high school Spanish teacher, and just sort of to, I mean, me and Pat's high school teacher, so I think I'm understanding them correctly. I think last year during our scheduling meetings, we looked at a couple different possible schedules where each teacher, if I'm remembering correctly, could have an additional cl class. For example, next year I'll be adding Spanish 5, so a lot of my Spanish 4 students are juniors, and hopefully we'll want to continue on to Spanish 5 next year. And that will mean that all of my classes will be filled and I won't have room for a double schedule, which means a lot of students coming in who might want to take Spanish 1, there just won't be another period of the day for them to be able to do that. But if we switch to a schedule where kids could take eight periods and I could teach an additional class like we had previously, then that would open up more flexibility in the schedule. So I think what we need to look at is um, and I know that my first year here, and I've been here six years, that we did have an eight period day, and we had, so I taught more classes than I do now, but when we chose to continue with this schedule, I lost a class. So a lot of teachers who, for example, are a department of one, couldn't have as much flexibility. But if we just chose a different schedule that had more periods in the day, then that would be possible without adding anybody else. Pretty much what I was going to also say. Just I, I know that the concern with you know 
taxes and said I'm a taxpayer as well. Um, it, I don't think it has to be, um, a, it's not a money issue at all. Um, I, we used to do it more effectively and I was one of one and a half English teachers. We now have you know, three. And I mean, there's, just, there, there's so many ways around that. I just don't want that fear of like, oh, my, we don't have to add anything. We can absolutely do this with the resources we already have. We could do much, much better for our students, for just humanity. <laughs> we just had a little attitude with that. I know as a student, I'm really excited about the be paying more if we had to in taxes, knowing that I'm getting a better education that will help me go into college, so give me a foundation for college or a foundation for whatever I go into, versus having this classroom where my C teacher one day a week and they're trying to cram as much as they can into it, so I end up spending more time after school with them, trying to learn, knowing other students are in the same boat, but they don't have the time after school, maybe they have to go to work, maybe they have something else going on. We need to find a way we can get everything we need in the week, in the school day, versus me going to teachers after, beg, like being upset, being like, okay, I kind of need help with this because I went home and I'm not understanding it. They're great at helping me, but I need to know that in my school day, if I have something else going on outside, I can get what I need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lori and Lynn Richard. Um, I just wanted to kind of, as a like zooming back, bigger picture comment, um, I definitely appreciate time and money considerations, they're huge, and I know that it's a really stressful time of year. At the same time, how will we ever fulfill the promises of the merger if we don't dig <coughs> into these conversations, not in a token way where one or two kids gets to say, this bothers me, or one or two parents gets to share their kid's story, but in a really thoughtful conversation about values and the schedule that genuinely gives all of the students at the high school the most access to opportunity. Like, if, if we always lead with no, we will never fulfill the strategic plan, and we will never fulfill the commitment of the merger. Personally, as someone who believed in the merger and continues to and worked really hard for it, I feel like we owe an obligation to all of the children in our communities to fulfill the commitment that we made, which was first and foremost to provide them with more opportunity. People are willing to do the work on it. I think it's really, really important that we not reflexively say no, but that we take the time and make a genuine effort to have a really thoughtful, reflective, and open conversation about it. Uh, really, Lori said a lot of what I wanted to say, which is, you know, budgets are not just about the bottom line. They are. I would be happy to never have to pay another dollar more in taxes again. That would be cool. Um, but the other aspect of votes failing is when people don't feel like they're being heard, when they don't feel like their voice matters, especially when two communities voted for a model and a promise that parent voice would be respected and listened to and implemented. That student voice would be respected and listened to and implemented. And I don't remember if teacher voice was in the articles of the merger or not, because it was a couple years ago, but it's absurd to have a two school, four schools, if you count the elementary schools, experts who work with scheduling every day and not to use their voice and not to integrate their voice. Like, we are resources parents and educators and students are resources. And when we were made a promise, and we voted on that promise, well, those of us who voted, um, but we voted for that promise. And maybe it's not logistically feasible to do something in the next three months for the next school year. Great, why can't we do it for the next 18 months, for the next five years? Like, I, I feel like we've gotten into this cycle where oh, there's no time! And then no one wants to put the investment into planning ahead for the next year. And so once again, oh, there's no time. We just have to go with something that somebody thought was a good idea. We don't even know who at this point. There's a whole stack of research and information over here, but we don't have time. And I don't want that to be the cycle for the next 10 years. Because we will start losing, but we will start seeing budgets fail. Even if the budgets go down, if people are angry and frustrated and don't feel like they're listening, being listened to, we will see budgets fail. Uh, we will see negotiations be harder 
because educators deserve to be listened to. Um, and so I think we look at this as an investment and maybe not, you know, a time crunch for the next six months, but as an investment we make for the next two to four years or five years or ten years of this school. I think I've been misunderstood. I, I fully intend, I and mean, we have intended since the April meeting, actually since last February we started to, to work on this schedule, it, it was clear that there were some, some things that we'd like to fine tune with it. Uh, there were a couple proposals that came to the table last February at the you know, 11th hour that it didn't seem fair to introduce into the process at that time once people had already committed to a vote, uh, and we stuck with that schedule. Uh, I fully expect to go through a process like has been done in the years past where I mean, the teachers voted on this schedule. Uh, you know, we, we went with a vote and over two-thirds of the teachers on staff voted to keep the schedule the same. Students were surveyed the week beforehand. Uh, the well, schedule again. that we have is the schedule that most of the students <laughs> wanted to have. Their, their biggest concern uh, in that survey that we did with students was that students like Alexis, who've been at the school for four years now, have had a different schedule every year that they, yeah. they've been at the school. And if yeah. we had changed it, this would have been the fourth year where they'd had There's a schedule change. Though. What? This is different though, isn't it? Yeah, because the learning block. Yeah, the learning block conquered. But I also think students just assumed that they would be able to um, have all of the opportunities that were laid out in front of them with the schedule. You know, we just, they kind of assumed that that would happen. It was brought up to me that my daughter might not be able to, you know, take electives just because she needed to get in the PE and health requirements. And then if she wanted her four core classes every year and a language and band and chorus, that's her day. Like, I just don't think that's fair. I don't think we are helping our students in any way by restricting a schedule for them. I think it's great that the community wants to come together and talk about it and figure something out. I mean, that would help with your time as well. You know, and I know you guys are busy, and I appreciate all that, but... And I, I truly appreciate all the work that went in. I mean, I, I didn't know this was coming. It would have been great to know that there was a group of folks in the community It was was working on this. I even sent it. She sent it out earlier than now, for sure. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I feel that there's enough parents and students and and teachers here that are in agreement that the that think the schedule can be reworked. That we should look into it. Uh, I would be willing to be on the committee. Your daughter's headed right in that direction. Well, she'll be in high school next year, yeah, so okay. yeah. I'd like to make sure she gets enough credits to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy. And enjoy. Well, it's about personalized learning. But, but right? I mean, you want them to like, really learn yeah, along so the way and know that they're both going Yeah, learning. let's take a look at okay. it. Okay. Yes. You know, yeah. I don't know what we can do, but we, we have to look at it for us to move on. I just was going to say, Lori had said it's time and money, but I also think the other constraint is scale, and I don't think that we've really considered that when we keep changing our schedule. Our school is too small for the current schedule that we have. I think it's been a stumbling block since we've tried to do this particular version of the schedule. And I would also say, just from a historic perspective, Years ago, we had a block schedule, and it was parents who came together and rallied to get rid of it because it, it was the same issues were happening. So I think in a really bigger, in a bigger school, it doesn't even have to be that much bigger, but larger than our school, um, there there's more flexibility because there's more staff and more room. But in our scale, I just I think that that really is something that has to be looked at seriously this time around. So just, I don't know, looking at this from the outside, because uh, my kids are too young to be <laughs> dealing with this yet, um, but it sounds like that there's, yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's some history where this was done before, and then we're in the sort of current format, and I know around the country that you know that these sort of go back and forth a lot and so maybe one thing that the committee should look at is what are the pros and cons of each because as you said I mean it sounds like there were cons with an eight block uh, type of schedule too um, and 
So I think, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of pro stuff for an eight block schedule, but I think, you know, we need to also look back and remember what, maybe what was the issues back then and are they the same issues now? And then what are the pros and cons with the current one? And is the solution something in the middle too? It's not necessarily one or the other, but, you know, it sounds like there's some sort of solution out there. Um, and, but, uh, but I think, Sometimes when we make decisions, we forget to look back at, at what was there before and what were the issues when we had it before, and we sort of look back on things with maybe some nostalgia and forget about some of the drawbacks. So I know that there are people with institutional history. I'm not one of them uh, on, on this issue, um, but uh, it would probably be good to you know poll and, and, and talk to people that have some of that historical background and, and try to remember what went right and what went wrong before. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sandy Cordell, my daughter's a freshman um, at, at the high school. And just to echo what Bridget and Lori said, I mean, if not now, when, quite honestly. And, and, and second of all, um, in, as evidenced by the research, the polling, and, and talking with some of these other schools that was done, we're not the only one. There are other schools in similar size, some a little bit bigger. They've been down this path. They've, they've had, they've got, they've, they have solutions. They've remedied it. Yeah, is it perfect? <coughs> well, maybe not. And they're still kind of working through some of it. But it's it, it, at least at least some of these schools that we're going to talk to, at least they've worked through it and they've had to develop these committees and they've worked through and they have solutions and it is working. And so I mean, I urge you to consider creating these these committees so that we can take a look at it. And like I said, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. Yes, Andrew. Um. I, do, I would encourage the administration to uh, utilize the parents' um, energies and engagement and stuff to set up some kind of plan for this. Um, one thing I did want to say, though, is it seemed like kind of the catalyst for this was changing music and chorus from the lens one to like, class periods, because that made us, uh, there was a schedule crunch. And it, that came with some benefits in that you know, they no longer, like the kids who are in music and chorus can now get the learning block benefits and whatnot. But it does seem like it caught, maybe caused more problems than um, maybe worse. So perhaps one solution would be rather than overhauling the whole schedule, just trying to go back on that one specific thing. Um, you know, I do think switching it to the regular class period increased the amount of time that you had for the band course, so somebody's in band course is getting more band course than they were before. But you know, if that makes it so they can't do other things, and maybe that's not good. So I don't know. But this is the sort of thing that having input and feedback and all that stuff is important. Yeah. yeah, I just think that as <laughs> if it's the way the wind is blowing to make this um, these committees, I think it would be really important to define how the decision making is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, because I've been on committees where I've done work and my colleagues have done work and it's sort of come to naught. Um, and I, I'd like that to be kind of clarified out front how the decision making around these issues will happen. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that's standing out to me most is not necessarily a time-bound process is what's being requested, but a deliberative process with all stakeholders included. And I have been consistently um, really inspired by the level of creativity that these communities come up with when people um, are given a charge and the ability to do some research and really be thoughtful about how to proceed. Um, so I think I feel like we're at a place where an exploration um, really needs to happen is what I'm hearing. And also I think we keep talking about the teachers and the parents in the room and taxpayers and these stakeholders, but I think we need um, a substantive student voice included as well. I don't think that can be discounted since they're the people most dramatically impacted by this. Yes. And students at all levels, yeah. the incoming eighth graders, the freshmen, and the outgoing seniors. That's right. all these senior initiatives have been. Oh, we'll talk to the seniors. But, and they're great. I love seniors. I have a senior. But uh, again, to look through 
because at different grades, as we've been saying, at different grades there are different challenges, there are different concerns, and a senior will see something different than a freshman, especially since for three years of Alexis' high school, it was a different schedule every year. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a different perspective. And so, you know, somebody who comes in as a freshman is going to have a completely different and very valuable perspective. We don't know if this is an item that we act on and vote on. Um, is it fair enough to say that the administration will develop a process for making a decision that incorporates student, teacher, and parent voice in the process of looking at schedules and considering a new schedule for next year? I, I'm not hearing that it has to be a new schedule for next year, necessarily, right? We, we need a new schedule for next year because of some problems with the existing schedule and the okay. contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. So can we expect discussion because okay. it involves a contract and okay. Can we expect to at least know the process by our December meeting? Okay. Yes. Can I just clarify? That doesn't sound like specifically what we asked for. Like that could that could be that a survey goes out to all parents. Mm -hmm. How's the schedule working for your kids? and you send it back on Google form. I think the request is that from, that we proposed to you this evening, is that both students and parents are a more substantial part of the conversations. How about we go as far as saying that parents will be invited into the school to discuss with staff and students their desire to have more opportunities through a different schedule? have that conversation and deliberate with staff so they can understand your concern? So my question would be, I have, my son's a junior, and we've been very fortunate with his schedule. It hasn't been a major issue for us, but I have a daughter coming in next year, and I have no idea what that schedule is going to look like, so I don't know how I'm going to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. So. And yeah, and that, I mean, that's, but I'm the, scared. The, teachers, I'm the, the teachers who are in the building have, have talked about this at length, for the last four or five years. So they, I mean, they, and they understand each time there's a change, they understand the strengths and weaknesses of any given schedule. So like one of the things we talked about when we considered an eight period schedule last year was that the length of classes could drop to 42 minutes a class, which, which would mean a loss of, I don't know, 30 minutes per week in every English class. And, um, we go from 50 minutes period to it's, it's, it's actually it's a net gain. Yeah. Yeah. It's a net gain. It's a significant net gain. By adding an eighth period? Yeah. I believe you, you're, I mean, you're taking seven periods and you're adding an eighth class, you have to reduce the, the unless the can, teacher contractual day lengthens, the only way to increase the number of minutes into eight classes is reduce the number of minutes in any given class. I, I believe that's incorrect. I believe that it's in that game. Um, I think we're having a committee. <laughs> I, mean, I think that this is, is, is it what it we mean, in my mind, for a deliberative process. Yeah. And, 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 and I guess we're, we're asking for non-token representation of the students. So that's, that's the difference. It's not, let's sit down once for an hour and everyone complains, but like, let's, let's do this process with it with a group that comprised of different stakeholders that are all a part of the process. I certainly understand as a parent that I have no right whatsoever in decision making. Um, and but I, I think we're asking for non token representation of, of our voices. And Lily um, would like to weigh in. Oh, I'm Lily. Um, I just wanted to say that with an eight period schedule, having those periods every day, it would be really helpful with like like languages. You get that every single day. Math every single day would be really helpful. English. Yes, <laughs> I would say if anybody's looking for non token representation, uh, you can always put your name in for the school. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't remember that anymore. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. And now. Okay. Brian, did you have your hand up? Yes. I just want to clarify, there's a difference between eight classes in one day and eight classes over two days as a block. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the solution that I perceive would add flexibility would be eight over two days. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you do sacrifice some time from the existing classes mm -hmm. to provide the flexibility because you wouldn't necessarily take that eighth class and just add it to your existing classes. Yeah. You were talking about opening up space mm -hmm. to allow flexibility. So there would be some class time lost in the existing classes uh, to create the room for band in uh, physical education and health class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions about Clarity around next steps or thoughts on what I would like things to proceed as well. We're going to come back with the proposal for next month, then hopefully it will be something that is satisfactory. Yeah, I think I think the things I'm hearing that we're valuing is that it's a represent it represents stakeholders and involves meaningful um, deliberation for the group. And ideally, we commit to having that meaningful deliberation have Over an impact. Time. What's that? Have an impact rather than sit okay. on the metaphorical shelf. Okay. Yes. I'm just a little concerned about the timeline. Um, kids have a four-year high school career. I just don't think pushing it forward. Last year, I don't think our kids got a schedule until the first week of school because we were deliberating this for so long. I just, I feel like with the committed people that this can be done. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be ready for rollout next year, not not squandering more time for these students who have such little time in high school to begin with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How, how about we try, that I try to meet with some representatives from the, the folks who signed this letter before Thanksgiving and discuss your concerns with them and try to figure something out. Reed, what's the drop in time when this has to be figured August out? August 28th, 2020. No. <laughs> That's the drop dead time. <laughs> when, when is the drop dead time for when kids have to sign up and know what they're is going to be offered. We we would like to have we would like to be able to start working on a schedule in early March so that we can have student schedules to them by spring break. That's what we did last year, and we that's the ideal. We could go into the summer without kids having a schedule, but that, that's not that's cool. what we want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we want teachers to know and be able to make their plans. So you got four months. So the goal of the meeting with the parent representation would be to determine the <coughs> committee structure, meeting schedule, those sorts of things? To try to figure out some form that that satisfies their desire to be an integral part of the process in, in voicing their concerns. While acknowledging that, you know, ultimately it's the educator's decision what's what's gonna work best and fits with the budget, fits with the contracts and et cetera. Okay. All right. Um, any any other comment? Anybody else want to weigh in? So we'll expect to hear at the December meeting the outcome of that, and hopefully we'll have parent and student representation here again to weigh in as well. Maybe Fiona Lily should be part of that too. Mm -hmm. Let's give it that. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> <laughs> thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so, our next item is reports to the board. For the audit report to the board. Um, okay. I Do you feel like you can answer our questions? Or like, yes. We are. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, sure, we can move budget and audit up in the agenda. Um, I'm going to 
we going to propose since we've been in here for an hour and 40 minutes already that we take like a three minute bathroom break? the need to move item number 11.1 .1, um, into the place of the superintendent's report because um, we'd like to hear from the auditor um, during the budget and audit discussion. Okay? So we've got the auditor on speakerphone, hopefully. His name is Ron so, Smith. His name is Ron Smith. Um, he was at our last executive board meeting. <coughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, hey, so listen to the I'll be yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we're having trouble hearing you. Hold on, Ron. It's like we're in the Ukraine. <laughs> okay. Um, so do you want to start by explaining? And then... So. Ron is here to talk about the follow-up from the executive board meeting, the very rough draft audit financials. Um, I just left for you tonight. Uh, that information is still not accurate because as of this morning, we finally got the SPED reconciliation from the Agency of Education, which does not allow the auditor's time to complete the cleanup of SPED and the reallocation of that expense to each of the individual districts as long as well as the SU. So Ron is on to talk about any questions, concerns, thoughts that you have additional to what we initially talked about. Willie, I did share with Ron your email that you shared with me for them to review and address your questions and concerns on the food service side of things. So if there's specific questions that you want to ask him for your side of it, he also is available to speak to that. I did not release these reports previously when I got them last Tuesday because I wanted to give you accurate information. I didn't want to give you stuff that I knew was going to change. But as of today, this is what I have, and I know you wanted something tonight in writing, so that's what I have for you. We can talk about the points where you're over or under. If you would like to do so, we've got some notes as far as that part's concerned where your big differences were budget versus <coughs> actuals. So Ron, does that cover the intro that we discussed? Sure. Okay. They also, the, the special ed money was something owed to us from last year. And uh, the agency, uh, we just got it this morning. Hey, Karen, I'm having a real hard time hearing whoever's talking. It's Bruce giving the background on SPED. The fact that we just got that this morning, and it was really the last piece of the puzzle, okay. uh, knowing exactly how much money that was going to be given to us from the agency of education. So, did you get so, that, Ron? Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Okay. So these numbers don't reflect that. No, these numbers don't show anything yeah. as far as what was released to us today on SPED. Do you have an idea of how it's going to affect these numbers? Got to make them bigger. So Ron, do you want to start in any specific place? Or do you want me to just kind of go over what we talked about? You can go over what you're talking about. You want me to go over or you want to go over it, Tara? I mean, I, I can start and give a rundown. I can certainly answer any questions that, uh, you know, that, they, that you all may have. Go for it. So, so I'd I, I probably start with, you know, special ed being certainly one of the biggest, you know, uh, uh, topics here, given the fact that we just got information as soon as today. And when we were sitting in that room uh, a few weeks back, you know, as far as the, the conversations go, specifically we're talking about the White River Unified District, one of the comments that was made is that the, the SPED and the supervisory union was going, basically the special ed budget piece was going to be overspent around $250,000. We actually think that that's going to be about $230,000. And based upon this reimbursement, that the, uh, uh, that the state just sent today and, and, and any loose ends that they're cleaning up as we still speak. And I, I guess I understand that there's still a few, and Tara can correct me if I'm wrong as we speak for 
June 30, 19. Um, the revenue projections are going to come in probably about $220,000 short. So what does that mean for SPED? SPED's going to be about $450,000 in the hole on the supervisory union level, of which about uh, uh, 40, 41%, I think, was the math for White River Unified District. So that means that that deficit, just to put a ballpark figure for you all, is going to go up by about $200,000, you know, based upon what we've got for information right now. As far as food service goes, uh, you know, the, the, the supervisor, there was a concern about the $100,000 deficit in this fiscal year. Um, the I, I have not had a chance to talk to your food service director, but I understand he was distributed some information, and I just don't know what he was given for information. But here's what I'm sure of, that there's about $80,000 sitting in the supervisor unit that was not distributed to the sub-recipients on December, uh, June 30, 2019. And of which I understand, and is Jane in the room, Tara? No, she didn't come. Um, and Tara, wasn't it about $38,000 or $40,000 was, uh, was the Unified District share of that? Yes, 38000 is what needs to be distributed to RUD's food service. And even with that $38,000, you all, the district in 2000, uh, for June 30, 2019, for the fiscal year, it's, it's good. It's, uh, the revenues, you know, over expenses is going to be in the hole about $100,000 service that we see based on the information that we're looking at so um, and I think that those are the those are the two big talking pieces there was some some uh, uh, direction that Tara wanted some some substance you know as far as um, uh, you know uh, the, 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 the general budget and some of the weak areas there for for the unified district and, and Tara did you, did you distribute that information to I them? didn't give those emails out because it didn't print right, so I have yeah. the, I have rough numbers that you can that you gave me that we can share, but they didn't print right. So yeah, operations and maintenance, as I recall, was uh, was basically overspent by about three hundred thousand dollars. Yep. You know, and that was largely in part two. If my memory serves me, it was contract and services, as I recall, Tara was a big piece of it. You know, I think that uh, um, that there were some other budgeted expenses, and, and and I really think that the big story is here is based upon the budget that you all passed. You know, last year for 2019, <coughs> when your prior management tried to set that budget up with a new chart of accounts, they just didn't talk to each other for sure. And what we tried to do is provide Tara with that bridge on what you guys all thought that you passed for a budget, and basically, you know, what your management posted to its books. You know, as far as for operations maintenance, you can clearly see in 2019 there's some big problems. You know, uh, with that. Um, um, Ron, yeah. this is Deb Matthews, special ed director. I did. <laughs> On that same topic of the issues with the budget last year, can you explain about the flow through? Uh, we get a federal grant called Idea B, which is yeah. about $500,000. And as I understand it, the revenue was put into the budget, but the expenses were not. Therefore, um, the, the, all the assessments were off because it's supposed to flow through. It's supposed to be a zero. Yeah. Yeah, whoever, whoever put that uh, budget together or held out putting that budget together to kind of make it flow through, you know, in that, uh, you know, in the, in the chart of accounts, it, it was a huge struggle for us to do. You know, to try to piece that together, Deb, and and, and, and let me just say, as, as as Tara, you know, is there right now? You definitely don't want to continue that budgeting process, you know, for sure going forward. And one of the things, you know, Deb, and we we we've actually, I think, got it broken down. I think that there are actually five struggle areas in the revenue piece, Deb, that yes. never materialized, you know, for for special ed. And, and, and Tara, that should have been part of that email. If it's not. You know, please give Deb, if he doesn't have it already, my email address, and, you know, yeah. and I can send you that. But we didn't think, Deb, that the revenue piece was going to be that big, but certainly, you know, based upon the state payment today and, and, and basically all the outstanding tuition and everything else that we think we've captured since uh, since uh, July 1st, uh, post-July 1st, yeah, it's, it's going to be about $220,000 short based upon how those budgets were projected, Deb. And, and I think that... Because the, when the budgeting was done, it was done incorrectly, the assessments that were originally sent out were incorrect, and then 
previously we have reassessed at least every quarter. The first year that we all came together, we did it more often. Yeah. And there was no reassessment, there was no looking at all as to whether it was matching up or not. And, and, and to also expand on that too, that when you're, you're talking about the reassessment, you know, one of the questions that was raised, I think it was by Lisa on the uh, Unified District Board, you know, was, was the carryover balance of what was used to put the 2019 budget together. Remember in 2019, that whole debacle was special ed and the reassessment you know, which is why it was very important for us to get you guys information and get it timely. There was probably, oh my God, at least, I, I can't remember what the number that was, but you, you have it. But that was actually, you know, arithmetic to 2019. We actually, Deb, have taken that out of 2019 and went back and restated 2018 because it actually belongs in 2018. And just as the state has paid you, you know, almost five months late, you know, with your special ed, we're trying to clean it up, Deb, so you know on June 30, 2019, what you carry over balance or you carry over deficit, you know, was in special ed so that we can make sure that we just got it in the right year so that when you guys go to budget, you guys know what you have for numbers. And, uh, and I think that this is the first year, you know, uh, in two years, you know, that we're, that we can finally sit and say that we've got everything in the right period. But uh, there were some real struggles with that special ed budget for sure, as well as maintenance, as you see in the emails that we sent to Tara. So. And I just want to mention as well that uh, each year I do a service plan and uh, for whatever reason, the numbers that were on the service plan, especially for uh, salaries and benefits, were, were seriously under budgeted uh, on the benefit portion of the budget. That was another area that um, was underfunded. And Devin, you, for sure you hit that one right on the head. That would be part of that buff may have issues that was solid in the budget. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ron, this is Willie Walker. I'm the food service director. Hi, Willie. How are you doing? Um, I noticed, I went through the, uh, the food service report that was passed along to me, and I don't see certain revenues that should be in that report. And there's a dinner program that we run, and there's no reimbursement this year on this for $41,000. That's the 38. I think that's the 38, and I think that's over the supervisor union that actually hasn't been distributed yet, as I, as I recall that, Matt, Willie. Okay, so that's what okay. But even with that distribution, Willie, we still think in the year revenues over expenses is going to be close to $100,000. You know, you're in the hole. Well, in addition, there's also some catering revenue of $13,000 I did that's not representing anywhere in this number. Here's, here's what I think there too though, Willie. I don't think that's in any, and, I, and Tara shared with me your, your email, and Willie, it'd probably be just best if you and I and Tara went over it. I don't think it's reflected in any of the district's uh, financials, Willie, that much, let alone the money coming into you. I don't think that there's any money coming out. And the concern, Willie, is it's gonna make some general fund deficits bigger as well on the other end if that money gets distributed to food service. But it's making me look like I'm an idiot with a hundred thousand dollar deficit. So, so, so let's, look, even with that thirteen thousand, Willie, with some of the bills that we saw, you know, to Ryan, it, it, it's still going to be somewhere. We think between ninety and hundred thousand. There's, there's food transfers within the building. You know, the seventeen hundred dollars. The fresh fruit and vegetable program is underfunded by twenty one hundred. My commodities aren't represented correctly with thirteen thousand dollars difference. I have labor dollars of four thousand dollars that don't belong in the in my labor report, and I know you're just giving the numbers, but it just seems like there's a lot of dif differences from what I have for receipts from the state and federal government that aren't represented correctly. Yeah, and, and Willie, I, I think that that was the state of the state of the whole supervisory union with special ed. And, and, and again, Willie, I just don't know what you've got for reports, but I'd be more than happy to sit down with you and Tara for sure, you know, before this is all finalized too, which we would have anyway, Willie, to, to just make sure that, we, uh, that we're all on the same page with the numbers, so. There were just a lot of transfers. It wasn't just food service that we tried to capture. I mean, there was a lot of transfers. The reassessment issue was special ed. The transportation, you know, assessments, some of those weren't booked, you know, and there was just, it was just a dirty tooth. 
2019 was just a disastrous year, you know, for for many reasons. And, and Willie, I think that food service, I think there's actually better ways and best practices to budget for food service so this doesn't happen. And, and I would have hoped that these questions would have come up during the year as opposed to five months after the year. I guess is where I'm going. So. And I, I would have loved to address those questions with someone, too. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I'm just a little frustrated with the situation. I don't think that's an accurate picture. And, 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 and Willie, let, let, let me just say, we're really just concerned about getting these numbers right so that this board can make good, informed decisions based on the information it's gotten. And the way that this information was delivered to us, you all, certainly isn't the way that, that we're having this conversation now. There's been a lot of work, you know, to have these conversations. There's still a lot of work to do. And when you're getting information at the 13th hour, you know, from the, from the state of Vermont, and, and then we've got to go back now in and reassess, you know, uh, the, the special ed, you know, assessments. I mean, it, it just makes everything problematic. And we just want to make sure when you guys put your 2021 budget, you know, that you're given, you know, information timely and accurate, you know, so that you can make some good business decisions, food service included, too. So. Well, that's my concern at this point in time, is how do we trust the numbers that we have budgeting moving forward? Um, because I feel like we've been asking good questions um, all along, and we've been provided with reports. And when the reports look favorable, and you're consistently asking where we're at with the budget, and the reports that come to you again look favorable, it makes it very difficult to trust and or verify because the information we're getting comes from the supervisory union and they're giving us the numbers that they have, which we're now learning are pretty substandard. Yeah, and, 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 and I would just add to that, and without seeing the reports that you have provided, I only know what was given to us. Some of these reports, especially for the unified district, you know, I mean, the, 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 the cleanup and the timeliness and the making sure that they're in the right period, you know, I, I certainly am up as you can understand the question about the accuracy of the information, but we saw a lot of red flags certainly in 2019 and, and, and food service just jumped right out at us that what we looked at, and again, I don't know what you, you were provided for food service or for special ed, Boy, those are the two obvious ones that were certainly, you know, concerning to us. And, and, and we actually started out with what was provided to us with special ed with a deficit of over a million dollars, and Tara couldn't believe it. You know, but because of all the, you know, the adjustments that got made and waiting to see what the state of Vermont was going to owe us, and that just finally came in today. You know, that's why we're able to have these conversations, and I'm hoping, you know, that we've captured all of that. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of work given to try to make sure that, that the information that you guys are all going to read that we're going to sign on June 30, 2019 is, is, is not only accurate, but obviously trustworthy. Yeah, because the reports we were given indicated that those areas were in the black. Yeah. I think it's also challenging for business level or for building level administrators to rely on the numbers they've been given as well. So. Yeah, and, and, and I think that it'll, 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 if you were to see what we saw, and Tara seen a lot of this, it looks like, you know, again, a lot of that previous administration, there were just numbers thrown in there through this transition and consolidation. There was really no follow-up, you know, to that. There was really no looking at the budget, you know, to make sure that that aligned with what you guys were thinking when you put it together. And, 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 if, and if Tara, if you share those emails with them, the biggest one you can look at is operation and maintenance so you can see what we're talking about because that's really the story for almost every department, you know, at the, uh, at the, at the districts. You know, some were worse, and I would say the unified district was just very, you, you could just see the struggles that they had to put consolidated information together, for sure. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about operations and maintenance, why that is such a huge number? So we had a question about why operations and maintenance was such a large number. Tara, I, I don't have my email in front, of, in front of me, but if you check that email, Tara, it will, it will stick out. I can remember contracts and services was a big piece of it. And so there were some other departments, as I recall, you know, there was transportation. It was, I, I think that, that was $100,000, and that was largely due to, you know, budgeting, as, as I remember, you know, uh, where that was placed for, for moving kids around, you know, for extracurriculars and, and some other matters, heat, insurance. 
I believe the superintendent's office or board of directors, you know, the health insurance was a big part of it. And, and Tara, you, you just have to look at those emails and provide yeah. them with them. I okay. just don't have them. Yeah, Sorry. I have them here. So. Okay. I don't, we can, I can go over them after we're done, Ron. I want to make sure they yeah. get what they need from you, so. Hey, Tara, if you look at the email specifically for Uncle <laughs> yep. you, on the left, Tara, that was your version of the budget. On the right was the actual approved version that that board took action on at that budget. And you will see exactly what we're talking about when that information was, when the books were put together, when the budget was put together, you know, through the consolidation, you will see exactly what, I, what we're talking about as far as nobody went back and cross-referenced anything we did. It, it was clear that nobody else there did. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have, it didn't print that way, so that's why I didn't hand them out, because it's very confusing how it printed, but I do have it. We, we, we tried to, we, we, what we tried to do, you all, is create a printing document to what you thought was going to happen, to what actually did happen, so that you can see the struggles, you know, as this information was put together. And as these books were consolidated and, you know, as budget entries happened or didn't happen, I mean, your budget, if my memory serves me for the unified district, I think, Tara, was out of balance by about $300,000 something yes. before we started. Yeah, it so. was. Okay. Do we have other questions for the auditor while we have him on the phone? Just... And I think that probably, so, so well, I, I certainly hear, you know, nobody wants to look foolish here. I, I know that this board just wants good information. I think our goal is, is, as you're kicking off budget season, is to give you something here, like December 1st-ish. And I'd be more than happy to sit with you all there at the Unified District and mm -hmm. answer some of these questions. But there's still some work to be done here, especially, you know, with special ed and going in and reallocating all this stuff. And I'm, Deb, I'd be more than happy to sit with you, you know, but, but, but we're just not going to be prepared to do that until December 1st ish. To make, just to make sure that we've got everything in that and that we can have all the conversations and sit in the room with you all collectively as a board, but we're certainly more than willing to do that for sure. All right, so. thank you. Any other questions for Ron? Okay. Thank you, Ron. Listen, yeah, Tara, just reach out to me and Willie, you know, Deb, you know, whoever you need us to sit with, you know, over the next uh, next week ish, you know, we're more than happy to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to bill you for that time. Perfect. So that what I gave you didn't copy all the pages, apparently. I will email you all the stuff that he sent to me. But as far as operation and maintenance were concerned, contracted services ended up being 101,146.22, and it was budgeted for 36,000. Repairs and maintenance was 128,197.96, and it was budgeted for 80,000. So those are the two line items that he was specifically referring to that were the big ticket items on the operations and maintenance side of the expenditures. Um, quick question. So it looks like on the Schedule C, the capital project funds, it looks like they're the same as what they were last year. So like, did, were there some things that should have come out of the um, <coughs> Prior to me becoming your business manager, did you as a board take any action to approve spending your capital reserve funds? Because the only thing that's yeah, happened since I came on here was the roof project, and that's on the current fiscal year, not last year. May I, may I offer something, Lisa? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and for context, um, last year we had multiple business managers and we asked for expenditure reports throughout the year like we usually got and along the way we received expenditure reports that had no indication of these overages mm -hmm. i want that to be really clear nobody was misspending with with malice i think we can all agree on that mm -hmm. and we are all sitting here with our hat in hand and trying to figure this out i think we could probably do some sort of forensic uh, autopsy if we wanted to, but I think one of the other pieces is to to really understand 
that we can't and shouldn't overspend like that. We can't have that bad information. Right. We had bad information all along the way. Or zero information. Can I, can I um, just want to explain that um, in terms of under budgeting, because I think probably the same thing happened for White River Unified District. Uh, the health insurance for the special ed staff was under budgeted by $209,000. The excess cost um, budget was, and this was under budgeted from the numbers I gave the business office by $100,000. Um, to have in a year on a seven million dollar budget to have a variance of two hundred thousand is not unusual given that the special ed is an estimate when kids move in you always think kids will move in kids will move out when kids move in um, we need to provide programs and it doesn't matter whether we're budgeted it or not um, we did have, I'm looking at the email when we do the service plan, uh, the state looks at everything, goes back and forth and says, well, this part of your budget is up by so much, can you please explain? Um, at the end of 2018, no, in, in 2019, five new kids moved in and were already in out of district placements. When kids move in and they're the majority of our special ed kids now are trending the 7 through 12 um, years, which tend to be more expensive. And so when kids come in in a placement, a new district just can't take them out of the placement and say, well, we're going to put you here. It's a process that takes time. So I mean, um, and the, I feel the same as Willie and Owen, um, you know, when information was asked for, um, what we got was totally inaccurate, um, and I apologize. I, I feel foolish that um, this has happened, but it's happened, and um, I feel that right now, having Tara in the business office and having the new team of people there, that we are getting honest information, and I think Ron is giving us kind of a forensic look of what happened over not just one year, but over <coughs> two years. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate getting, I, I feel like this this mess would not have been surfaced without the work that Tara's been doing and without the work that's been happening recently. And I just feel like if we hadn't had an opportunity to dig deeper, um, it could be much worse even, as terrible as this feels right now. Um, so I am wondering about the hiring of accountants um, because applicants are not looking very promising. So I do have a backup plan if I can't find a suitable person in the position. Yeah, I'm deeply concerned that those are vacant. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want all of you to know that this has been a really difficult year, year and a half. Uh, we have probably five people who were in our business office that are no longer there. And I think the teachers and, and the members of the association know that it was a struggle last year. They were deeply affected by this. We were all affected. I think we're eight months into uh, a reconstruction of the business office, starting when Tara came in in early March. Um, We've spent an awful lot of money uh, getting her mentored by uh, somebody who's got a 30-year track record, Marilyn Frederick. Marilyn also helped us get through the budget year last year for this year. And uh, I don't know what I would have done uh, because she was really the only reliable person uh, that we could go to during budget season last year. Business managers are really, really hard to find, and you can either steal one from someone, and we probably don't have enough money to do that, or you can try to build one. And that's the plan we have done in trying to invest a lot of resources in helping uh, Tara, um, you know, work on all of this. Uh, and she's been great. Uh, and I also have, my heart goes out to all the people in the business office now that have done double duty, really. Um, these people have been around for a while and, and uh, we are 
a small unit, but uh, we do need a, a county help, and we've got ads out looking for a, a person and a half. Uh, we're hoping to find somebody. We're not going to just take anybody. Uh, and the backup plan that Tara outlined is having the auditor uh, relinquish one of their their audit people to work with us until we can find somebody permanently for ourselves. And, and we're pretty confident th this process of digging down and trying to figure out what what's going on um, has been good in a, in a couple different ways in that uh, it's helped a lot of obstacles we had to get over that we learned about and, and are re reassessing and changing. And we've also had a very good connection with our auditing firm. Uh, there are people that have reached out and are willing to come over and work with us if we don't get our own accounting accountants right away. Um, so, you know, this has been uh, it's been a struggle, and what you're hearing about is is the outcome of last year. And we're going to do everything we can to overcome this without having to. Um, you know, affects taxpayers, uh, and that is uh, putting a slowdown on the budgets, uh, trying to uh, do whatever we can in order to be able to, to make it happen. So, and those those plans are already in effect and have been for month and month and a half. What plans? To slow down the budget, try to okay. end in good state, in good. Uh, Instead this year, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe be able to apply some of whatever that is to uh, some some of what we're behind in, uh, so that the taxpayers don't suffer with that. So we're just trying to be more efficient and more effective in, in being able to clean that up. It's really um, brought within the business office. We really tightened up processes and procedures and we started to establish criteria that wasn't there before. So I think that's been a really good experience for the veteran staff within the business office to kind of have that overview from the top down and understanding how each function that they do feeds up to the top and the top feeds down. And I think that my understanding historically is that's not always the way it's been in the business office. It's been very cellular. And to break those walls down and to really make sure that everybody understands their pivotal part in the big picture. And to make sure that, you know, if you make this change on your end, you are now impacting four other things. And to have that understanding, they may not necessarily have had that understanding before. So I think that's made a huge difference. You know, if you process one invoice that's not coded appropriately, what impact that has. You process one payroll and that employee have, doesn't have the right code, what impact does that have? And you know, that's really been an experience that necessarily may not have always been brought to light in the past. And that's where a lot of our, you know, when I came on, I started seeing these reports and realizing as I've shared with you all so many times that things are just not where they're supposed to be. And, to get those things fixed and to make sure they're accurate moving forward is really pivotal to making sure that you're getting the accurate information on your budgets. Um, <coughs> so for the backup plan, um, in light of not having qualified applicants for the accounting positions, I'm just wondering to what degree having someone from the auditor's office, because my understanding is that they might be pricey, hinders our efforts to then put someone full-time and permanent in that position. The, the goal with the auditors is that they would be working with me. Okay. They would be showing me the ins and the outs that my accountant would come in and do on my behalf. So that would be a very short-term solution as we're continuing to try to find the right candidate. Mm -hmm. Hiring someone that doesn't have experience is not going to be a help to what we right. need right now. We really need someone who's qualified, and who understands fund accounting, because mm -hmm. fund accounting is very different than regular accounting, and it works very differently. Um, is that F-U-N? Yes. Yeah. Fun. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a popular response, but like my heart hurts for you guys, because I know Ron real well, mm -hmm. and when I was in your seat, spent a lot of time on the phone, and it's like deja vu for me, and I know that the business office piece is really difficult. It's very difficult to recruit. Um, 
and I know what I heard Bruce say about kind of stealing people and budgets, but I really believe that that's a place where you need to put the funds in and you need to defend putting the funds in. Um, because look at the return on your investment when you're able to do that and look at the losses when you, when you don't. And it's hard for people to swallow, it's hard for taxpayers to see administrative costs go up, um, but I would so strongly advocate for that because this has gone on, at least from a Bethel perspective, for years and the turnover and I love to see that you're here and that you know they're supporting you well and I hope that you find the qualified accountants um, but I really would I mean that's and it is hard to defend that mm -hmm. but it really is a place that's incredibly important yeah. part, of, part of the problem I mean when Donna was here Donna was uh, great and she uh, was a good accountant as well as a business manager uh, it was pretty easy to see that that wasn't the same after she left and uh, we the people that came in afterwards didn't stay very long and you know because it was difficult for them and um, you know we had those hard conversations and uh, that doesn't help to clean up last year We've got to face it, and uh, you can't hide it, and it's it's got to be what it is. Uh, and I'm sure that these are going to be tough conversations as we get into town meetings uh, in March about about all of this. But you can't hide it. it. It has to be out on the table. We have to try to do better from it. I take full responsibility. Responsibility, I do. I mean. Uh, and I've lived through it with all these people, uh, and uh, like I say, many of them are gone now. But uh, you know, I think we're in, in a good place and building better. But we've still got to hire some good people. Um, one of the things that will happen is Marilyn Frederick, who's been working with Tara all along, will go away. She's she's been out, and the auditing help will come in. Uh, about the same time that happened. So it's not going to be a budget buster, we don't believe. Um, and Tara has has created some strong ties with a couple of the auditors. And they've, come, they've been willing to come over here and, and work with her on the ground. And a lot of that has to do with coding, making sure things are in the right places. And that, you know, it didn't help at all that the state required us to go to a new computing software at the same time. And now we understand we're going to have to jump again to another one. So that's part of the problem is, is, a, is a whole new software. So why, why is, I mean, every time you get jumped to a new software, it screws things up, and now we're trying to rectify things, and now they're making you jump again to, to Wait, screw add, it up again? Add one more layer in here. We, when the mergers happened, you went to a different chart of accounts. That chart of accounts wasn't established in time for the security <coughs> cycle and for the software system to be initially set up, so that was all done post-transfer. We then have to transfer another chart of accounts effective July 1st this year, of 2020, which is the state's universal chart of account. And it continues to be... They never had system. one before, but now they're, and they're the making the purpose behind that is the future goal is that by having every school district in the state using the same chart of accounts, it makes the reporting to the state more efficient and more streamlined. And the point of the e-finance software transition is the same thing, that every school district is using the state mandated software and as a result of that, they can generate the same report cycles, they can get the same information that they need to get to make it on the AOE side, receiving information more efficient and more consistent. The SLDS system, um, where is how we report up all of our students and grades and all of that information, that was also put into place last year. So it changed the way you reported your student accounts to the Agency of Education. So the end goal of all of these changes is to make it a more streamlined, more efficient, consistent process all the way across the state. So that these lag times that we're having with getting information up to the state and getting information back to them goes away. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's the goal. 
but the downfall is I'm sure like every other company, whenever you go to a new software, you always have bugs and to fix that. We are blessed to be the very last grouping of schools that has to go to that software. So all of the other schools in the state of Vermont will, have, will go before us. And so hopefully all the bugs have been worked out and by the time it gets to us, it'll be smooth sailing. That's my optimistic mm -hmm. view on the software transfer. But that is ultimately the reason why, <laughs> is to try and streamline all of these processes. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when we, as the supervisory union, moved to Infinite Visions on the recommendation of the prior business manager, Infinite Visions was one of the runner-up for the state software. RSU moved to Infinite Visions before the state made their decision, unfortunately. <coughs> but the other one that we didn't go to. So that's also part of the, the downfall. Mm -hmm. But it has to happen, we have to do it. And I, there's many business managers and several auditors who feel like it's still going to go away. I don't share that same opinion. The state's invested too much money in this. It'll be similar to what they did with my Health Connect. I just don't want money to make, make it work. So that's my personal opinion. Yeah, Andrew. Um, so I guess, you know, slowing down the budget now is good. What I'm curious about is, given what we know about the spending from last year, do we have an idea of whether the budget for this year was correct? It's basically you're saying that we didn't budget enough in the budget last time, and we were basing the current year budget on that previous budget. So you know, are we going to see the same kind of over this, this year, or is this kind of a one-time thing? You know, I do have... Absolutely. So in terms of special ed, um, because that <coughs> half a million dollars of flow through was put in incorrectly last year, we have revised everything for this year so that we can see as soon as Ron comes and talks to us, then we can see if we need to do an extra assessment. And part of the problem is if you chew up the books once a month at least, and reassess, then you kind of have an evenness going through the year because new kids do come in. Um, when you wait till the end of the year, then it, it just hits you really hard. So the right. idea I mean, is. I'm not even really thinking about special ed right now. Well, but it's. it's I mean, a that's big, not even included in the right now. Well, but it's also going to impact. Yeah. You know, but the same process I think is going to happen. Ron is going to sit with us and we're going to basically re redo the budget and then be able to know if, how far off we are. And we're we're up on tuition kids. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a good sign for this year. Right. And as far as current year expenditure reports, your principals have been awesome. They have been monitoring their expenditure reports every month when I send them out. And I get pages of questions and corrections that need to be done. And we get through them and we do them. So I think right. as we pay more attention to what potentially could have been a rollover of account coding errors from the prior year, we're definitely recognizing them and fixing them. I mean, we, they went through a huge process of making sure all of this, the faculty and staff had the appropriate codes. So Anne went through and recoded all of the payroll, and then we had to do a bunch of journal entries to clean up what had been paid prior to when the fix was done. So we're definitely working very closely to try and make sure that things are where they need to be so that we do have a true understanding of where you are now right. and where you are each month moving forward. And I'm working um, with other business managers to really try and get more, especially for the ones who have already rolled to e-finance, to get some consistency in the reports that we can generate out of Infinite Visions prior to moving to that transfer. So I know one of the things that you had all said when I first came on is that just the view of the reports alone changed all the time so that you never really knew what you were looking at. So I'm trying to find there's so many report options in the system. I'm trying to find the ones that work the best. And my understanding historically is there's really been a focus in the supervisory union on expenditures and not necessarily so much on the revenue side of things. So to really make sure that when we're looking at reports, we're looking at both sides of the picture, not just the expenditures, but also if we see all of a sudden that we have a shortfall in revenue, that, you know, when I we know that and up front, not I guess like in February when Marilyn came to you all and said we have a revenue issue. I mean, 
that's too late to know that. Mm. So to really make sure that that information is out to you in a more timely manner, which then comes back to the business office and really solidifying the practices and the procedures and the way that we're doing things in the business office to make sure that that stuff is happening more timely <coughs> so that the reports to you are more accurate <coughs> as well. Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely good in your show. Um, that's what needs to happen. So when we have this, you know, right now it has the, we have this unassigned fund deficit of 96,000. So we're going to have to incorporate that plus whatever line up in the in the next year's budget. I think that's the It takes three years, but it's probably best to do it as quickly as you can. Okay, so we don't have to do it all next year. Right? No, I think the statute of last year, if I remember, it was three years. Now we're going to have that for when we come next month. Yes. Um, and that was one of the things that Ron had pointed out in the executive board, is that's the downfall of the statute, is when you're looking, you're basically looking at numbers that are two years old when you're building a budget. and through the audit process, they then have to go back through and reconcile prior year accounts receivable and accounts payable, which then has a direct impact on that surplus or deficit that you've already potentially used <coughs> in your next year's budget. So it really, yeah, so it really does cause. You know, however much we can do to figure out encumbrances and figure out like if we are going to have some sort of uh, that we're going to do in the surplus and how this year accounts is that would definitely be and that's what we're working really hard to right. do. Um, you know, I'm a little, I, I'm really concerned about, you know, basically like when we did the budget in 2018 for last year, like it was starting with just adding, like the number that we started with was just the two districts separately added together. So him saying that there wasn't, you know, and like we didn't, account for things in the budget, like it started with the two separate budgets that were good. So I don't see how we wound up. And then we added the five hundred thousand dollars on top of that that was because of the tax, you know, um, the yeah, merger tax cap stuff. So I don't see how we wound up going four hundred thousand dollars over that when we you know so we clearly have a lot of work to do to figure out the budget. So if I can just explain, you heard him say that initially he thought that SPED was a million dollars off. And the reason that they thought that is what had happened is assessments had been entered, entered into the system like they had been sent out and collected. But they were never sent out and never collected. So it's that whole revenue and expenditure so that they were like, well, you know, a million dollars had been collected, where is it? You know, so that's, those were the issues, I think, that happened because nobody, whoever was right. putting it in. But I mean, like, the bottom line we have now is that, you know, we had, a, according to this, we had a net deficit. That change in fund balances of $466,000. Mm -hmm. And that's, with us already having added a hundred, you know, a bunch of extra spending into our budget, and, you know, we increase the taxes by a bunch more than we would have otherwise. Um, so, anyway, we need to figure out what happens and... And not do it again. And so yeah, what, not do so what but, happens yeah. next, so that you understand what happens next, because I had to get my head around what happens next. The auditors do their thing on their side, and mm -hmm. then they send it back to us, <coughs> fix our side, to match what the audit is. So once, my understanding, once that process has happened, which my understanding is it's thousands of journal entries, once that process happens, I should then be able to go into the system and generate the detailed revenue and expenditure reports that will give you that backup documentation other than the summary numbers that are shown in the audit itself. So that is my understanding of what can happen. So once that process is done, that will be what we will do, is we will print those reports and we can look at the detail behind that to see right. where things were up or down after it's all set up. So if he meets his December 1st deadline, 
you and me get together in December, which I give you a heads up now, we're going to need more than your one meeting in December okay. to go over this stuff and mm -hmm. to get your budgets and to look at that. Because you're the town clerk has told me they want their reports by December 17th for the book. I said, well, I don't think that will happen, most likely January. But um, there will be a lot of conversations that we're going to need to have around the budget cycle. And you have to be patient with me because it's my first time doing the budget on this side of the table. So I'm learning a ton about that and how that works. So. Does that mean we're going to try to meet in early December along with our third Tuesday of the month? Because you are plan to have extra meetings. Okay. Um, so we can maybe add that to our discussion of future meetings at the end of the yeah. um, next meeting day. Um, I also, at our executive board meeting, Ron mentioned that he has been doing in Chittenden County um, trainings for board members related to how what to really look for. Um, and I just think that would be incredibly useful. Um, so I don't know if we can collaborate with other school districts and have other boards attend a similar training from outside just even the SU. But, um, or if he's running one someplace else, I mean, I would travel to attend that. I just think it's really important that we know what we're looking for. Absolutely. So I have emailed all of you mm -hmm. the four emails that he referenced, so you should have them all in your inboxes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please give us another like new stuff comes in, like just whatever you have. Okay. 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 Any other questions related yes. to this? Yes. Just comment. I think it's important if we don't make if we don't get the information back in the audit in time for our town report, um, still put some kind of notation in the town report so that folks, you know, to, to, to describe the extent of what happened here from an accounting perspective so that folks like Willie and the food service and, and maybe folks in, char in charge of the property and grounds don't take the fall right. for these, right. but, you know, make sure that that's clearly spelled out in the report. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so that brings us to the superintendent's report. Um, we are, um, I've, I've put together a list of uh, dates possible for, that are open on the calendar for negotiations. Uh, I've sent that to Don Shaw. Most of you have seen that in my odds and ends. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we're going to be able to get together for a beginning session to figure out which of those dates we might use. I think I, I put them out till January. Um, and of course, the longer we wait uh, in order to be able to schedule those, the more those are going to be filled up. So um, I know the union has written us and is anxious to start to get uh, some meetings together. Um, I haven't seen the proposal uh, on the state health care yet. I hear it's, uh, it was supposed to be out, um, I think, on the 15th of November, but I haven't seen them. The two positions from the union side and the management side, the state side, uh, and the arbitrator um, was supposed to select one of those, and it was supposed to be ready by December 1st. So we, we don't know where that process is. I certainly haven't seen anything. Usually I will get it and I'll send it out to all of you. But you, you may get it at the same time I do. So um, we've been having some conversations here in the building uh, with Owen and Andrew about space. And especially I've become aware that there are some kids that uh, may need uh, out of district placements and we're trying to avoid that. Uh, so we really need uh, to uh, perhaps uh, look at finding some space here in the building to uh, expand the restorative uh, middle school restorative program so that we can avoid some of that. As I told you before, the restorative program has a track record now of 
about returning about 41% of the kids they work with back into classrooms in their own schools. That's huge. It's really a high number, and I credit Deb and Dr. Ketterer and the staff in, in being able to make that happen. A lot of these kids uh, have been in the program for a year or two, uh, three years, but they are uh, headed back into the classrooms where they came from uh, with their peers in other buildings uh, around the SU. Um, if, if somebody is sent out to a program like <coughs> Academy, and they're not special ed kids, because not all the kids in the restorative program are special ed kids. That costs $35,000 to the school district in order to do that. We'd like to avoid that if we have a program here in-house that's uh, really uh, exceptional and, and is, has got the track record like the restorative program that ha has developed. And I just don't know whether people know that, that we've been able to uh, you know, send a lot of those kids back into the classrooms that they should be, that they came from in the schools they came from. Uh, the idea uh, that we've been floating around is the possibility of combining two small preschool programs into one with both, with two teachers. Um, and using uh, the space where one of the preschools is, which is behind the gym in the old, I don't know what that was. Was that a uh, it was a shop industrial arts know. area where that That's preschool good. is, and, and maybe combining it. So uh, we'd like to do that now. We'd like to do that in in a, in a planned way. Uh, and I know uh, Owen and Andrew have been talking about it. Uh, we don't think it'll be high impact on the kids. That would mean a class of there are two classes of nine kids right now. It would be one class of, of eighteen, which is doable. Uh, we don't know if kids will move out or kids will try to move in, but that's what it is right now. And I wanted to be upfront and honest with you about that. I think it's a good move, um, and it would help us to uh, have those kids uh, that, that we're having to have go out, maybe stay here, and, and be worked with uh, by a program that's very effective. So I don't know if you have any thoughts. Um, you know, I want to be, like I say, upfront and honest with you. I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's possible that we may get a new preschool kid in now, and we, we, it's also possible some may move out. But uh, we don't we think that's that's uh, a good good use, and it will also open up the space where the the uh, program is now um, to be repurposed for other other folks uh, here in the building. So I'd like to move on this, um, and we've talked about uh, putting a plan together that'll allow the kids uh, to adjust to it uh, over time. Uh, so I don't know if you have any thoughts. I don't. We don't usually ask you about room changes, uh, but um, one thought I do have is that if you're a negative, you know, negatively impacting our programs to accommodate the restored classroom, I do feel it's appropriate for the restored classroom to provide some financial support for mm -hmm. our district. Um, part, you know, it does save a ton of money, and I don't think it's unreasonable for us to get a little bit mm -hmm. of that for hosting. That's probably a discussion that you need to have at the executive board, uh, because... Mm -hmm. ahead, I mean, the problem with rent is that you, you would pay 49% of the cost for rent. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. Not a, we would receive almost 60%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beyond the set. And you know, I, I expect that if you guys are looking to expand it in other buildings too, and if you know Chelsea or Tunbridge ever opens up their buildings, we'd be willing to pay rent for them. You know, I think if, if somebody's using facilities like we pay heat at the restored classroom you know, mm -hmm. these expenses that come out of our budget. And right now we're talking about taking you know a classroom that's currently in use and repurpose it to a different use. And so you know, this is not of no cost to our district. Um, I, just saying that, I really support the Missouri Classroom Program. I do see that it saves a lot of money for our district and uh, is a great program, but, you know, I don't think it's fair that we should bear all the brunt of the costs of it. Right, I, I think, think that's something that I think about too, and definitely when other board members have 
entertain the notion of having restorative classrooms in their schools. I've been asked by other board members what the rent is or what the sort of return is on having it in our building. And I just think that having some sort of mechanism for that and being able to share with them what that is, um, for people who are really focused on the bottom line, um, I think that makes it feel more equitable for them. I mean, we currently house all the restorative classrooms for the entire SU. Um, and that's because we have a board that really believes in the program and we've been willing to be good partners um, in terms of this work. But I think that as the program needs to expand, we need to look more carefully at guarding our resources and also um, ensuring that there's some return beyond the fact that we all live in central Vermont and these students are people who are going to be in our communities too. Well, I just also want to point out um, when you say, you know, there, one of the returns and, and maybe David or one of the principals can talk about it, you, you have some ready resources in your buildings when, um, when there's some issues and some, I mean, that's one of the, the positives of housing it. But I think we have to be careful because it's not a collaborative, you know, especially law has all of their rules. So it's not a collaborative program. It's not an independent school program. So, you know, my concern is, is will tuition be next? Because if we start doing tuition, um, then it's going to be a problem with the state and what we call right now, it's an alternative classroom, which they've accepted. Um, without having to, to go through a few more hoops on on the different kinds of special ed placements you can have. Right. But let's say we have this alternative classroom in the, um, <coughs> the academy building. Mm -hmm. like we have to pay rent for that. Mm -hmm. like maybe, and presumably, the, the store can come in the SE budget. Right. And then, right. And, and, if, and then it gets refunded by the state too. So you know, it's not just that the other districts will be paying the cost. But then these expenses get, um, you know, special ed funding, and so that gives you the 60% um, payback for that. Right. So. But there's no mechanism that I'm aware of, and I could, you know, they might change the rules on special ed to start charging mm -hmm. tuition, just so you know. The other, the other little nuance here is that we've got a lot of people knocking on the doors from other districts and other SUs that want to bring kids here because they know. Well, we can't get to them. We don't want them all. You know, yeah. I know yeah. No, it's from, from somewhere else we can charge a tuition fee because we're going to have to pay rent for that. Charging and tuition, and, and frankly, um, we have one kid right now that's being tuitioned in that wasn't a program and moved. Um, and so, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out if we're, we're compromising anything by doing this. But in terms of you all charging tuition to each other, then that turns yeah, no, into something else. I don't think we're talking about that. Yeah. We're just, you know, it's, it, it's as if, if you had to put this in this sort of thing, and, and the academy building, or you know, if you didn't have room, you had to do something about it. You pay money in part of the budget. So we're just saying, do the same thing for the month. Like when we accompany, move the classrooms to accommodate the sort of classroom. Like, it seems like there should be some. Rodney? Well, I wanted to. I want to make sure we have plenty of room for our preschoolers, too. I don't want to cut them short. Uh, we were trying to expand that two months ago, and now we're trying to downsize it. Well, the kids didn't show up. I mean, well, we're going to have room for the ones we have. Or well, I mean, 18 kids in a class. We don't want to well, we don't want to it out in one room. There's two teachers. is not uh, well, how, how big is the room? It's a regular size classroom. Well, I mean, that could work for this year, but if you get the numbers of kids next year, then they're just going to have this issue again. So, you know, I, I trust the administration, our principals, to figure out the appropriate, you know, what, what's needed for the preschool, for the strong preschool program. So, you know, if they're comfortable with the changes, then 
Well, that was just my question was, yeah, how many of these preschoolers are continuing into kindergarten next year and how many are staying in preschool? I mean, I know we don't have really any sort of estimate because we haven't done the preschool screening for next year, so we don't know how many incoming three-year-olds we have. But, uh, but I mean, I guess one question is, you know, how many four-year-olds are moving up to kindergarten and how many of the we three-year-olds know, We know that not all of them are four-year-olds. Okay. Right, so half. So it's half and half right now, and <coughs> half are going to go out, okay, and some unknown number is going to come in. I, I just want you to reframe the problem. The problem is we're going to end up sending some kids out of district, and you're going to pay full price for that to get, for them to go. And that's not going to be special ed funds for some of them. It's anywhere from 35000 up. We're, we're sitting here worrying about a special ed problem we have and we've got to deal with some of these things and we have a program that we can expand uh, to try to handle those kids without having to and avoid those costs and that's what I'm talking about doing with not a whole lot of inconvenience to the preschool that we have right here right now so uh, these all unified district kids that we're talking about or are they SU kids when we say there are kids there are kids right in this building that I'm talking about I could number name you the number but I don't really want to do that in open session <clears throat> um, I talked about negotiations I'm pretty good um, I, I had a question about negotiations. Shannon was our representative um, from this board to negotiations, and she is no longer with us. Um, so based on, um, I don't know, comments have been made in the past about the potential for conflict of interest for me because I work in a neighboring district. Um, Rodney's wife teaches here at the school. So that means there's only really three people um, on our board. And there's two, two two negotiations. There's support staff and right. professional staff. You don't want to have one person doing both of those. No. Okay. Happens. I mean, I think Shannon did last time. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering if we have a volunteer willing to take on that role, representing our board, or even deliberate and let me know, think about it, talk it over with your Significant others. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's a lot of fun. We really we have a good time. Is it? I feel like I'm missing something. But. Missing great food. Okay. No, I'm. We're not doing food. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for that. Um, okay. So that brings us to the principal's report, right? Okay. And. Are you guys receiving that now? By email, did you get included? Awesome, thank you. Is there anything you want to highlight or share? We have an incredible fundraiser on Friday night, BINGO. $2,400. That's amazing. Yeah. And, um, we also sent off Wendell Wills off in North Carolina, and uh, it was one-way ticket. It's a joke. <laughs> anyway, it was a very nice assembly with all the school, and uh, nice words were said. Mr. Laps came over and said some nice things. That's, uh, we're reading actual books every day in middle school. I hope so. Still no <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Still no phones. <laughs> Yeah, really wonderful. That's not enough, though, right? <laughs> okay. Any good questions? Yes. No, I was just got comment that I appreciate the newsletters that yes. have come out the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Oh, and any okay. news on the Windows replacement? No applicants. I could tell you that um, RTC <coughs> has received a grant for mm -hmm. a middle school pre-tech pre program and they have reached out to Bethel to have a STEM class here on campus. They sent a teacher 
and all the uh, resources, and we just need to provide a space, and they can serve 10 to 12 kids for half a school year, and they'll commit to us for this year and next. They're going to be meeting with our faculty soon. And there was a play last weekend also that I heard. The director. Author, no, director, director. Yeah. Yeah. Oscar Wilde took on that. He did. He lives on. One of one of the stars is to your right. Mm -hmm. and, and Alexis is one of the other mm -hmm. leads in the play. Anyway, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, something that didn't make it in the principal's report uh, that you asked for information about is mm -hmm. driver's ed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I talked to Tammy Pregent. I don't know if I said that right. Mm -hmm. Who is in charge of driver's ed? the AOE um, and the guidance she provided to me is that our obligation is to provide driver's ed instruction to all residents of our communities that we collect taxes from. Um, so that's any homeschooled kids, that's any schools who pay tuition to go to other places uh, outside of our towns. Um, we are also obligated because we take state money to uh, provide driver's ed to any students who tuition into our school. Um, okay. I, she was clear to me over the phone that um, that we don't have an obligation to pay for students in the SU who choose to go to another high school. Okay. Uh, I'm working on getting that in writing to make sure. I asked that. that, that uh, Reed get that in writing yes. because that's not exactly the version that I got. So that, we need to have it in a lot more sense. Yeah. So the yeah. version came from same person. <laughs> same person. <laughs> oh, really? That's why I'm saying it needs to be it needs to be in writing because it's a little bit changed since. Okay. Well, I given asked. given this understanding, you know, if Sharon Academy wants to provide us with some funding for building the program. Correct. We, we can accept funding from another school to provide driver's ed instruction for their students. However, we cannot accept tuition dollars directly from families or students themselves to enroll in our program because we're collecting state money. But we're under no obligation to provide it for at all. free. Right. And certainly not to provide spots at the okay. expense of students who do go to our school. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yes. So the, the Visbit uh, study that was done um, ah. seems like there were some things in there that you know, it seems like some spaces just need to get reorganized and stuff needs to get moved out of the way, the electrical mm -hmm. panels and things like that. Uh, and it sounds like you all are working on it. You know, I think you know, the first priority would probably be like some of the electrical stuff that they point out. Yeah, so we, we approved a new electrical outlet to move the deli slicer in the South Royalton kitchen. It's about a $450 expense that's not budgeted, uh, but it's a pretty serious safety concern. Um, putting a carbon monoxide detector into the kitchen, that seems mm -hmm. like seemed like a no-brainer. Uh, but one of the recommendations was to provide, to create a new space uh, for the uh, hot part of our wood shop. So we've got a machine shop that we teach students how to use welders and torches and that sort of thing. Uh, and it was, you know, the report was clear you shouldn't have wood products and sawdust in the same space as welding equipment. Uh, so, so if we want to continue to have a wood shop uh, and a, a tech program like we do now, we need to be looking at another space. How is it? I don't know if that's building an extension off the back of the building or what. Well, and with some of the GFIs too, I mean, if it gets to be a bunch of outlets, if they're all in the same circuit, you can get like a GFI circuit breaker instead of having the individual GFI outlets too. So, but I mean, electricians kind of consult with you all and give you those mm -hmm. estimates and stuff. Any other action that um, you know I know that our maintenance director uh, Lori Egan is doing is simple things like if people weren't supposed to have incandescent lights, they're taken out. If, Things are supposed to move certain distance from doorways. They were moved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it like it was okay. Anything else? Yes. Um, I did just want to say I noticed in the principal's report, which is what I've been looking at on my phone, 
Um, it does talk about involving middle schoolers in the musical. And while well, that's a great idea in theory, uh, and I firmly believe that there should be access to theater for everyone, I do worry about the logistics of that and the fact that middle schoolers deserve to have their own theatrical experience that they get to sort of lead themselves <coughs> to involved in. I've done theater for years and middle school is definitely really important and really helpful when it was divided up. So I do just want to put that out there. That, like, take that into consideration. Don't just throw them in there for the sake of not doing something here. We have a lot of drama here. <laughs> Thank you for that, Alexis. <laughs> so we're the, we're the hiring updates address. Sorry, why I'm laughing. The hiring updates that I requested be on the agenda were the accountants, so I feel like we've addressed that. Yes. Okay. Okay, and okay. Um, we have some policies to review. Um, I don't know if we want to count this packet as a first reading and move them to the next agenda since it seems like it would be hard to focus deeply on them. At Act on them at the next year. I think, I think you have so to warn that you're approving policy. Yes. So, so I think the idea is we could read them and come forward either ready to approve or with revisions that need to be But I think made. December 3rd is the next policy committee. So if you have suggestions for the revisions, I would look December 12th. Sorry, 12th. Great. You can get them to me before that. Okay. Okay. Does the one policy need to be in the packet since it's just for the share of the school district? And They're using that as the policy? Uh, right, you passed, it, you passed a different yeah. version and they corrected uh, by adding the principal in there to right. the superintendent. <laughs> yeah. And the policy committee decided that they should accept that one other than the, rather than the one you had accepted. So it really is, it says shipping, <laughs> but when it's fine, when it's finished, it'll say, uh, or for the SUV. Mm -hmm. Sorry that about that. We've been trying to work toward a goal of greater continuity, um, and so no one objected to the language that Sharon proposed, and so that's what we decided to move forward with since they felt very strongly. And there are several that I brought to the policy committee that aren't ready yet to bring to you guys. They mm -hmm. they needed more language work and. Uh, some reference work. Uh, I brought the ones that I thought were really no-brainers and had, had passed. So uh, we also have some physical policy that would be coming forward. Put in place as well. Um, and if we're going to have multiple meetings in December, we can try to approve these at the earliest meeting. I just want people to have time to go and like space to really thoughtfully read them. Okay, we have one more public comment. Thank you. No? Okay. All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to have public at our meetings.